Hello and welcome to the Australian Roundtable Podcast. It is Sunday the 11th of January 2015. This is episode 14 of our weekly broadcast live at youtube.com forward slash Australian Roundtable from 4pm Australian Eastern Standard Time every Sunday and also archived at ozroundtable.com for later listening. I'm your host Jono and I'm joined in the studio as usual by Ethan Nash of TOTT News. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. And we are usually graced with the presence of the Silver Fox Lindsay, but he is unable to join us today due to family commitments. As always, we wish him well and hope to see him again soon. Today, we do have some good news with our second special guest of 2015. I'm pleased to introduce to the show, Zach. Thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. No problems. Now, we'll get to a proper introduction for you shortly, but before we do, I'll read out the short little blurb that we do for any new listeners who might be joining us for the first time. The Australian Roundtable Podcast is a Brisbane-based independent news analysis discussion panel podcast, which broadcasts live every Sunday from 4 p.m. AEST. Episodes are available to listen to live and are also archived for later listening at both the Australian Roundtable YouTube channel and our website, ozroundtable.com. Live listeners can also partake in a live chat forum at the YouTube channel, during broadcasts. The show usually features an eclectic panel of presenters who come together each week to discuss recent and topical news and current affairs from Australia and around the world. The show provides an alternative perspective to that presented by the mainstream media and is aimed at listeners in Australia and abroad who are sceptical of the official narratives being pushed by the government and the corporate media. The views presented are by individual panellists and guests are not necessarily representative of the entire panel and each presenter is solely responsible for his or her own comments and claims. All important information cited during the broadcast will be linked to at our site ozroundtable.com so you can verify and analyze it for yourself, which I for one recommend you do. Episodes generally run 90 minutes and although it is a roundtable discussion, we do keep to a rough structure for each episode and generally focus on a small handful of discrete topics every week and I'll get to today's rundown right now. We'll start off by introducing Zach to the panel and then we'll get straight into our domestic segment and we'll look at uh, the following topics. A father who was arrested for using medical cannabis with his children. Uh, Another update on the Sydney siege. More terror raids, minus the terrorists, the recent anti-vaccine debate taking place in Australia, and Australia's mainstream media coverage of the Paris event, which will segue nicely into our international segment today, where we will discuss at length the Paris event and its ties to a certain country who have a lot of say in other countries' affairs. So that's a rundown. We'll get straight into it. And that is to introduce Zach to the panel. Thank you for joining us. Give the listeners a basic background to yourself and why you're here. Well, yeah, I've just been interested in these kind of topics for a long time, and uh, it's been many years since I've been researching into government corruption and whatnot, and uh, I was really excited when Jono invited me onto the show, and I'm really pleased to be here. Yeah, fantastic stuff, and it, it as I said last week, it's it's amazing just that not only people are waking up, but more and more people are wanting to become involved now. You know, you, you mentioned that you've researched for a lot of years, and now... You, now you're getting involved with shows like this and, you know, trying to voice your opinion. Um, is there any topics at the moment that particularly take your fancy? Like, do you have a specialty field that you've been researching over the years? Well, I'm not so much into topical stuff, which is a lot of what you guys uh, cover on this show. I'm more interested in the broad philosophical implications for humanity and the macro economy. So, but I'm also very interested in what you guys have to say about the Australian economics and Australian politics. Yeah, well, obviously we have lots to talk about with Australian politics. Last week on the show, we had Tim O, who is a very close follower of Australian domestic politics. Obviously, the show is more aimed at a wider audience, and I think many of them are tuning in today to specifically talk about the Paris event, which I can promise we will get to. But Zach, I was hoping you could tell us when you first realised that the media was lying to you or that the government was lying to you and how you came to deal with the fact that maybe the government isn't the friend it portrays itself to be. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, Jono. Um, it happened when I was about 18 and um, the catalyst for me was watching videos on YouTube like a lot of people do about the 9-11 conspiracy. And um, the smoking gun to me was Building 7 falling down for no reason. And that was just... The genie came out of the bottle and I just kept researching and kept researching and it's never really stopped. And I've just found out a lot and it's changed my whole perspective on life and what I thought was true and now what I think is true. Yeah, it's a big... uh... It's it's a big shift of your reality once you discover that everything around you has been a lie. And nine yeah. eleven was the catalyst for most people, I would say. If if not for most people, it was a major part of the descent down the rabbit hole. It was for me. I know that. And it's just as you said, waking up on YouTube, um, as most people have done, it 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 
reinforces how vital the internet is and how we must keep the internet and stop it from being censored and continue to fight past, you know, Google and all of these companies that are trying to continuously shut down free speech because it is a tool to wake people up. It's the only tool we've got, John. Yeah, well, I mean, the film Loose Change, I think, was released about 2007 at the same time as um, another documentary whose name is Zeitgeist. So Zeitgeist and Loose Change came around about the same time, and a lot of people went through that early phase of waking up at the time. Here we are seven or eight years later, and there's a whole new wave of people waking up because of all these staged events that are taking place. And Sandy Hook and Boston bombings, I think, for a lot of people, certainly for a lot of our listeners, that was when they went through either their first waking up or their real waking up. It's one thing to realise that the government is lying to you about what happened on 9-11. It's another thing to realise that they will even completely fabricate events to serve an agenda. And I think what's happening right now, not just here but around the world, is a growing number of people are waking up to the fact that, wow, everything in the mainstream media is either a distraction or, more often, a complete lie. So the question is, Zach, do you still watch the mainstream 6pm bulletins? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jono, absolutely not. I haven't watched uh, media, TV for years and years, so I wouldn't really know what kind of crap they're churning out anymore. Well, that's why I love to have one of many reasons why I love to have Ethan on the panel. Because <laughs> this guy can't get enough of the mainstream news. Yeah, I love it. I, <laughs> as we've seen over the past couple of weeks, I'm very up to date about what's happening on the news. Um, but all jokes aside, I do, I do keep in touch with it because I went through that stage where I completely boycotted it, but then I needed to watch it to analyze what's happening and to analyze just how uh, further the descent in terms of uh, manipulation in terms of serving agenda goes. So I do watch it all jokes aside for just an analysis basis just to see because the media is the most prominent thing that is controlling us and has controlled us and has told us what to think. So um, I, I do watch it for that reason, but uh, it's definitely not something that we should have in our lives. So. Well, we'll be discussing the mainstream media in a number of our segments today because really mm. that's the one common thread with so much of what we discuss on this show and on the other shows that I'm involved is, is the fact that the mainstream media can truly control the minds of the masses. It does that all the time. And I think every single topic that we're going to go through today, we'll get to that. But before we get to those topics, Zach, I do have one more question for you, and that is when you started going through the process of what some people call waking up, what I call yeah. deprogramming, call it whatever you like, when you started going through that process, did you find yourself losing friends or family or losing some of the connections that you had as you realized that they were still plugged in? In a way, yes. But to be honest, a lot of my friends and family came along with me on the ride. Hmm. And um, I think I'm better off now that that's happened because my friends now really understand what the world is and my family has kind of changed their mind a lot as well. So you're seeing even people in your family starting to wake up to what's going yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's very promising. Uh, I ask these people this question a lot is... You know, what happens? Do you find yourself losing friends and family? And in this community that, that we're involved in, this event skeptic community, there are people who are losing friends and family as they start to mm. realize the media is all fake. And I think that's one thing that we offer with this show and with shows like We'll Do It Live and uh, the Match Distance Roundtable is, hey, here's a community of people who you're not going to lose because you're waking up. In fact, they're going to welcome you with open arms because the more of us, the better. So, Zach, it's fantastic to have you on board. And hopefully uh, over the course of the show, you can see how we do things here at the Australian Round Table. <laughs> <laughs> we do miss Lindsay. And if Lindsay is uh, listening at home, uh, uh, all the best to you, mate. We have to see you again mm. soon. And uh, maybe when you join us, we'll have more regular panelists. <laughs> the next 70 minutes are going to say a lot about that. Now, let's get straight into the domestic segment, Ethan. And the first topic on the agenda is a father who I believe was arrested for using medical uh, cannabis to treat one of his children. Mm, yeah, terrible news um, mid last week um, that uh, has really caused an uproar amongst uh, the, the obviously the, the the community that pushes for medical cannabis and for cannabis to be industrialized and used uh, as the proper um, you know herb that it is in a society that tries to suppress it and has done throughout the entire twentieth century. But uh, I'll just read out an article. One of many that was on the web, but this is from the Northern Daily Leader from January 8th. Um, Adam Kosler, I believe you pronounce his name, was charged at a Brisbane hospital last Friday for supply of dangerous drugs to a minor after giving his two-year-old daughter, Ruma, medical-grade cannabis oil in a desperate bid to treat her stage 4 neuroblastoma cancer. Mr. Kosler has been bailed to face court on January 20th, but part of his bail conditions is that he is unable to have contact with his daughter. 
Since being forced off the cannabis oil last week, Rumi's condition has dramatically worsened and she is now in intensive care on morphine. The arrest has outraged medical cannabis activists who claim parents should have the right to treat their own children with an effective medicine. Mr. Kostler said the oil, which contains none of the compound which gets recreational users high, was having a, quote, miraculous effect on his daughter. Quote, what we saw when Rumor was given the medical cannabis oil was nothing short of miraculous, he said. Her cancer-ridden body was alive again. Rumor had almost instant quality of life. She would say, Daddy, my tummy's not sore, and she would be able to eat like a champion and begin to gain weight. Her energy was up, and she wanted to go outside with me instead of lay on her back with her legs curled up. Her skin color came back, her eyes were sparkling again, and we just looked at each other in complete amazement. Mr. Kosler's arrest comes as New South Wales government rushes towards medical marijuana reform with a range of clinical trials announced last month. And for those that are in Brisbane that are interested, there will be a gathering at the Brisbane Magistrate Court in support of Adam on January 20th from 8 a.m. onwards. And you can keep up to every da- everything uh, at his Facebook page, which is Fearless Father. But Jono, uh, yet another terrible story in the in the in the news this week, and it has to do with a topic I know you're very familiar with. Well, I am very familiar with the conversation of marijuana legalization, and I actually started getting into this topic a little while ago when I realised that the war on drugs is costing we the peasants, and the only people who are profiting are a small cabal of people who make money from locking people up, from putting people through court, and from selling these drugs on the side once they get them. I mean, there's a small group of people who benefit from it, and it isn't we the people. So I've always looked at marijuana legalization as being almost an economic question, you know, mm. rather than a social policy one of what makes more sense for the people to waste their taxpayer dollars on trying to prohibit something that you'll never stop or by legalizing it, taxing and regulating it. And as you know, in the United States in the last couple of years, something like four or five states have actually legalized this substance, not just decriminalized, but legalized so that you can go down and purchase it just like you would purchase alcohol. Okay, not dissimilar to that at all. And so you look at questions like this. Here's a man using this substance to treat a problem He is getting direct results, good results from it. He would know better than any lawmaker in Canberra or in Spring Street. He knows this better than they do. And he's saying this is working for me, yet we're locking him up. I mean, if that doesn't tell you just how sick our society is at the moment, I'm not sure that anything will. Zach, what say you? Oh, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, it's hemp oil. It's not even the drug itself. Mm. I mean, he's not giving his young daughter a drug. He's giving her an oil to help her with the cancer. So I think that's kind of outrageous that he would be treated like a criminal yeah for for nothing really it's absolutely sick it makes you sick thinking about it and it it really exemplifies just how evil these people are that when you go to these medical cannabis rallies and you see people you see children and people that are dying and they want you know what i mean They, they want the aid for it and they can't get it because of some lawmakers sitting around in a building that get paid to screw us over on a regular basis are making the decisions that's when it becomes because this is people's lives now this yeah. is people's lives and you are denying them the, the chance to get better and have done so since you've known about it during the early 20th century and not to mention all the other you know the industrial uses hempcrete you know how you can make clothing out of it you can run cars on fuel from it all of this that would completely collapse the system well they don't want that Absolutely. And sometimes I'd like to imagine the future when things get better, which with every passing day, I'm more and more confident things will get better eventually. So always darkest before dawn. Right now, things look terrible, but I'm confident that things are going to get better. And when they do, we'll look back at these times when people were banned from growing their own medicine in their own backyards and forced to go to the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry to get stuff that's made in a laboratory rather than grown in the ground to treat their illnesses We'll look back at these times as being crazy times. We'll wonder who was in charge, how were they allowed to stay in charge for so mm-hmm. long, what were people thinking, and don't worry, you better believe that right now, not just in this country, but in other countries, especially the United States, people are waking up to this fact that they've been lied to about drugs, they've been lied to about the effects it can have on you, and the benefits that they're never told about, and they're waking up. There's a mass awakening taking place, and that's where I see the whole issue of marijuana legalization as a terrific gateway issue to get people to think about the fact that the media... And their schools and government have lied to them. And once they realize they're being lied to about drugs, it's not such a big step to take to realize they're being lied to about terrorists or different threats that might be facing them or what have you. To me, this whole issue of marijuana legalization, we haven't given enough time on this show because 
of all these other events that we've had to cover, yeah. <laughs> but I would love to cover this more because it is a terrific gateway issue. Definitely, absolutely. And I think in future episodes, we, if <laughs> our track, world, <laughs> track record's not so good, but I promise one day we'll be able to get to it, and I've got a lot to say about that. So I'm glad you mentioned to... that. I forgot to say in the opening blurb, we were supposed to be covering, of course, the climate change uh, issue today (laughs) and we're going to have to push that back to next week again because of all that's happened so if anyone who was tuning in specifically for us to discuss the climate change issue don't worry we'll get to that eventually as soon as these uh staged events stop taking place but i won't say too much more on that we'll have to move on to the next topic unless you've got more to add on that one there no it's just for people that want to go out uh fearless father on facebook if you want to follow his campaign and you know as always support and, and if you don't know, educate yourself about the benefits of medicinal cannabis. What's more comical is what do you think happens to all these confiscated drugs? Do you really think they just <laughs> throw them out? <laughs> or do you think they use them themselves or do they sell them and make more money? That's exactly right. That's a good point. And you don't have to have known too many people who mix with certain people to know that this isn't even that well hidden. I mean, it, it, it's very blatant for anyone who's yeah. involved in this at all. And I guess if you're a 50-year-old home watching the TV and the TV says there was another drug bust, you know, this is good for the war on drugs, it's going to reduce, you know, drug availability or whatever, it, you don't have to be too involved in this to know that that's complete bunkum. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, those drugs haven't been taken off the market. And secondly, even if they had been, all that does is drive up the price, which brings new people into the market. It's supply and demand. And so long as the supply is there, it doesn't matter if you put little dents in it. Sorry, as long as the demand is there, it doesn't matter if you put little dents in the supply, someone else will fill the void every time. This is Economics 101. Yeah, well, it's like they say, it's the DEA shuts down all the competition of the CIA. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Exactly. All right, well, we'll move on to the next topic, and that is an update on the Sydney siege. Now, as everybody knows, in episodes 11, 12, and 13, we went right through the official narrative, and we more or less shot it to Saturn, Ethan. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping to leave this topic behind and move on to new things. Not that we've stopped covering this. We're both doing our own work independently to produce other things in the future. But as far as this podcast is concerned, we were hoping to leave this topic behind. But I read something just recently, Ethan. I know that Mr. 79 Sav in the live chat mentioned this as well, that piqued my interest, so I thought it was worth covering just one more thing to do with the Sydney siege, and that is the more inconsistencies in the official narrative of the Sydney event. Now, as I said, we've already discussed much of the event, and especially Channel 7 news crews hanging out during the so-called siege with the operational sniper who allegedly radioed in that the gunman had killed a hostage, which precipitated the, the, the raiding of the cafe that led to some deaths. Uh, we also covered the evidence that Channel 7 lied uh, about why they were with the sniper, and the proof is irrefutable. Case closed, shot to Saturn. And we said that as of this week, we'd return to our regular format of discussing a range of other topics. Just the one important update. Before I give the update, though, let's revisit the official story regarding Katrina Dawson's death as given to us by key Channel 7 presenter in this entire operation, Robert Ovadia. Now, this is from a news article entitled Sydney Seeds Katrina Dawson Was Killed by Gunman's Bullets Report. This is on the 18th of December, 2014, so a couple of days after the incident. Quote, Katrina Dawson was killed by gunman man Harren Monis, preliminary ballistics reports suggest. Channel 7 reporter Robert Ovadia has tweeted the mother of three was killed by several uh, shotgun pellets that severed her aorta. End quote. Now, this is the tweet from uh, Robert Ovadia. Now, this is the tweet, quote, Breaking, at 7 News Sydney, preliminary ballistics report suggests Katrina Dawson was killed by gunmen, several shotgun pellets severing aorta, end quote. Now, back to the article, quote, There had been some confusion how Miss Dawson was killed, with a suggestion she may have been struck by a bullet fired by police who stormed the Link Cafe after Monis killed fellow hostage Tory Johnson. The post-mortem on both victims has been completed, and their bodies are being released to their families tonight. Police have previously said they will not comment until an investigation into the shooting is over, end quote. So that was the official story. Days after the event, Ovadia had an inside contact who reliably informed him that a ballistics report indicated it was the gunman who had killed Dawson. Now let's look at a Fairfax article from yesterday. This is from The Age, an article entitled Martin Place Siege Victim Katrina Dawson Struck by a Police Bullet Investigations Show. 10th of January 2015, quote, Martin Place siege victim Katrina Dawson was struck by a police bullet when officers became involved in a shootout with gunman man Harren Monis in the final stages of the Link Cafe standoff, a police investigation has revealed. The circumstances surrounding the 16-hour Martin Place siege, which began on December 15, is still the subject of a critical incident investigation being run by the Homicide Squad. However, multiple sources have told Fairfax Media that Miss Dawson, 38, 
was struck by a police fire that was not a direct shot and possibly a ricochet when they stormed the cafe just after 2 a.m. on December 16 after Monas executed another of the hostages, cafe manager Tori Johnson at close range. Katrina Dawson was killed in the Sydney siege. Miss Dawson's cause of death will be determined by the New South Wales coroner once a critical incident investigation is completed. A police spokeswoman said the police force would not be commenting on any aspect of the investigation until that process has been completed. And quote. Well, well, well. Yet another <laughs> inconsistency to add to the list. Why are police leaking anything to the mainstream media? And why are they leaking such contradictory stories? And is it any surprise that Ovadia, who is second only to Chris Rees in the Channel 7 contribution to this entire operation, was the one who originally reported that it was the gunman who was responsible? Now, I could go further into this. For instance, I have on video footage evidence that the response teams, in inverted commas, performed CPR on at least two people outside of the cafe immediately following the raid. Now, if Dawson's aorta was severed, no matter who fired the bullet, then one wonders what could be gained from performing CPR. <laughs> I mean, think about it. But even this is buying too far into the official narrative. The basic fact is this. We have been given no evidence, either photographic or video, to verify that either of the supposed victims were even in the cafe when the incident took place. The closest we have to evidence is the testimony of clowns like Bruno, which we already exposed as a nonsense in earlier shows. The only reason anybody has to believe any of the official narrative is that it is being repeated by the mainstream media and the government and police. And as this latest development proves once again, you can't trust the mainstream media, government or police to even keep their own stories straight. Boys, what say you? That's exactly right. And I saw this article last night when it was posted uh, speaking about that and I'd known that there was contradictions between that and we've exposed just countless contradictions for this the official story but i said hang on a minute i've come to the conclusion it was a staged event yes but i am going to use this to capitalize on the official story and tear the official story apart with the official story justifications in without pushing the notion i like expressing the notion that it's still real and everything happened the same way i did with 9 11 when i speak to people and i say that the Iraq war and you know going to Afghanistan was illegal under international law because you're not declaring a war. Al-Qaeda is not a nation. You're declaring war on Afghanistan, which under international law causes big schmozzle. And I would get to people through that, saying that even if you believe 9-11 is real, it was still illegal for them to go there. Now, I'd done the same with this, and I cut out uh, your fantastic breakdown of the sniper, um, the, the sniper... Uh, excuses being uh, unjustified with all three excuses and I cut that out and put it on my YouTube channel uh, youtube.com forward slash TOTT news and I put uh, visuals and information there with it because I said I'm going to capitalize on this and say so they say that Katrina Dawson was hit by a police bullet the police and media in this video have been proven that their justification is wrong and that the sniper could have taken Manharan Monas out to prevent this. Therefore, the police and media should be held accountable. And I got through when I posted that. I resonated on a level with a lot of people because I stuck to the official story. So even if you, even at the surface level, you don't even have to prove that this was a staged event to prove that the government was lying because their contradictions are so bad and now they've just shot themselves in the foot because we can prove the sniper could have taken the shot and he didn't because he was told not to. And that's the main thing. And because Katrina Dawson was killed by police when they went in, they should be held accountable. So what do you think of this event, Zach? Well, my initial suspicion was that there was something fishy. I actually wasn't in the country when it happened. So I only heard about it after I got back, but it's just too convenient to me that there would be a Muslim guy trying to <laughs> do something after all these months of fear-mongering about Muslims in Australia, the months leading up to, and it's just totally consistent with the lies that they have done for years, in my opinion. Mm. Well, you, you were out of the country. You got to miss out on all the media coverage of it over here. <laughs> it is a question, though. These uh, so-called Muslim terrorists, why do they wait until after the terror threat level is raised to high before they go and pull off their schemes? Like, you think about it logically. 
They've got less chance of succeeding in theory when the terror threat level is high. But also, once the terror threat level has been raised to high, what do they hope to achieve from this anyway? Why not just sit on their plans until a few years later when we lower the terror threat level back down to medium and then pull off their heists? Why do they always do it after the terror threat level has been raised? Think about it logically. And they somehow always slip through the system. <laughs> what are you it, saying, Jono, that it's somehow politically driven? <laughs> well, well it's, it, look, it's funny you ask that because in the live chat box, Silver Slave Triple Three has asked regarding the siege, well, then why did they do it? I think we covered this really well in episode 11. We went through what happened on the day of and the day before the so-called Sydney siege, a whole bunch of events that were very conveniently covered up by the Sydney siege, as well as the legislative and historical context leading up to the so-called Sydney siege. I mean, this is part of a much bigger psychological operation, which has a couple of benefits to the people who are pulling it off. One, they can pass more draconian anti-terror laws, and two, they get more support for their wars in the Middle East, which do not help this country in any way, shape, or form. Those are the two most obvious ones for me. Ethan, what say you? No, I completely agree, and we did break it down fantastically, and it just seems like all of these events happening around the world, as they are, they're following the same agenda, and that's yeah. why they're just so happenly uh, popping up in every country that's going to be a part of this coalition into this future world war that I believe is coming. It's just ironic how that happens. And it's ironic how every single terrorist, they say, was on a terror list, but somehow slipped off the terrorists. So what better way than to flip that to justify, well, we need stricter you know, we need looser guidelines to get people onto the list and then we need stricter li- uh, stricter guidelines for them to not get off it. And then when it's flipped on us, as we become the extremists, it's going to be impossible for us to get off of it and we'll be the demonised enemy. And I think most of our listeners know that. Speaking of listeners, Lenny Leverhume, who I think might be a new addition to our live chat at the Australian Roundtable, said that he thinks Mrs. Police Commissioner probably did it and ran off with Bruno. <laughs> 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 Lenny, good to have you in the live chat there, mate. And I noticed that Mr. 79 Sav has just mentioned something very interesting, which I haven't had a chance to confirm yet. But he says that if you look into Catherine Chi, one of those initial lie witnesses, he reckons if you look at her Facebook page, you will find that her father works for the ABC. Now, that's the first I've heard of that. Uh, for you guys in the live chat, or for you, Mr. 79 Sav, we can't do this while we're on air. But if you have that page, can you please save a copy of that? And make sure that if they do take that down between now and we get off air, I can still check that out. Do us a favor and just screenshot that one because that is a very interesting mm-hmm. update, if true, Ethan. Definitely. Yeah. And just as we wrap up the Sydney siege, with once again this final uh, just startling <laughs> contradiction once again, I just encourage everyone before our individual work comes out, giving an in-depth look at the Sydney siege, go to the TOTT News YouTube and share that video because, as I said, through the official story, you can get that out to everyone to prove once and for all that it was that the government have lied about it. And, of course, the video you're talking about is how last week we discussed how the ballistically impossible excuse for not using a sniper to take out the gunman was predicated on this claim that you can't shoot through reinforced glass. And so we discussed how you can look at studies from 20 years ago uh, technical studies, full 90-page reports with complete and good methodology showing that that's nonsense. You can shoot through the glass. If it's at 90 degrees, the ball doesn't even deflect. And if it is at an angle anywhere between 90 and 45 degrees, it will deflect, but only marginally so, to the point where you can still hit a target five metres behind the glass. We shot that whole claim to sat, and I saw that video that you put together, Ethan, where you uh, overlaid images from that report as we had the audio from last week's show going. That's fantastic stuff, and I hope that our listeners do go and check that video out at tot10news.com and use that one to share with people. It's very hard to get people to listen to a 90-minute or a two-hour podcast. It's just too much time for many people. They'd rather be watching Dancing with the Stars or whatever. But a 13- or 15-minute video that just goes through one of the many inconsistencies of the story, shoots it to Saturn, far more chance of picking up uh, mainstream, not mainstream attention, but bigger attention, possibly viral attention. Mm. And I think the video you put together was fantastic. So listeners, please check that out at tot10news.com, a video that Ethan edited and that uh, was from last week's show, which I watched all of last night. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. Now, we do have to move on to a related topic, and that is the fact that there have been more anti-terror raids here in Australia. Now, I've got a little bit of information here, so I want the listeners to bear with me. This will sound a little bit monotonous, but just bear with me. This is very important now. In episode three of the Australian Roundtable, we discussed the farcical terror raids of September 2014, which involved some 800 police officers, many dressed in tactical gear, and raiding dozens of homes across Sydney and Brisbane, which led to a grand total of... Zach, want to guess how many terrorism charges? Two? 
one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even then, that charge is based upon a phone call that the alleged had received from somebody else suggesting that he should behead somebody. That's it. 800 police officers, dozens of houses raided, one terrorism charge based on that. And it got even more comical when it was later revealed that the sword which had been taken from one of the raided houses and had been flogged across all of our mainstream media at the time was in fact a plastic sword. (laughs) I laugh every time I think of that one. (laughs) So anyway, that was of course a a blatant and a classic psyop, that's clear. And it took place on September 18, which was a month after the first fake ISIS beheading video and a week after the terror threat level in this country had been raised to high. Then of course on Monday, September 22, Abbott gave his Less Liberty for More Security speech to Parliament, which I'm going to quote a little bit of right now. This is from Tony Abbott to Parliament on September 22. Quote, Regrettably, for some time to come, Australians will have to endure more security than we're used to and more inconvenience than we'd like. Regrettably, for some time to come, the delicate balance between freedom and security may have to shift. There may be more restrictions on some so that there can be more protections for others. After all, the most basic freedom of all is the freedom to walk the streets unharmed and to sleep safe in our beds at night. Creating new offences that are harder to beat on a technicality may be a small price to pay for saving lives and for maintaining the social fabric of an open, free, and multicultural nation. End quote. And even just reading that, I feel dirty. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading words on a page and I, ooh, shivers down the spine. Now, the next day after that speech, Newman Hader event took place. And the NSLA bill had its second reading. And then the day after that, the government introduced a CTLA bill into the House. These are the bills that we would went into great detail in episodes one, two, and three on, Ethan, you recall. Now, only the most programmed of coincidence theorists could have failed to see that those raids were part of a larger plot to terrorize the people into accepting draconian anti-terror laws. Well, the PSYOP is still ongoing. Here is an article from yesterday about yet more terror raids. This is from Yahoo 7. The article's entitled, No Bail Bid After Sydney Anti-Terror Raid. And this is from the 10th of January. Quote, Two men charged after separate anti-terror raids in Sydney's west will remain behind bars until at least next week. Omar Amush, 33, was charged with ammunition possession offences <laughs> on Friday after counter-terrorism police raided a home in Greenacre in Sydney's west. Jabril al Mawi, 21, was charged with a string of offences, including unauthorised firearm possession, also on Friday after a separate terrorism raid in December. Amush was arrested on Friday during another raid under a similar but separate counter-terrorism operation, end quote. So here we have two separate anti-terror raids, in inverted commas, yielding firearms charges against two men. And what is the evidence that these guys were in any way related to terrorism? Nothing. (laughs) From the article, quote, Outside court, their lawyer, Adam Huda, said neither of his clients were charged with terrorism-related offences. There is no suggestion at all there is any links with any terrorism, he said. Asked why his clients were targeted by a operation specifically targeting homegrown terrorists, Mr. Hooter said it was a question for the authorities, end quote. A question for the authorities, indeed. Why are supposed anti-terror raids being used to target people with zero links to terrorism? People who aren't even being charged with terrorism once they're arrested. These guys were charged with firearms offences, not terrorism. They weren't terrorists. Criminals... Uh, Yes, if the charge of illegal possession of firearms is proven. But in a country with more guns in circulation now than before the Port Arthur event, illegal gun possession is rife in this country. Uh, This is very different to terrorism. So the question remains, why were these two guys targeted in separate anti-terror raids? Well, the answer becomes clear, Zach, when we look at a News Corp article on the same raids. This is from the Daily Telegraph, titled... Omar Amush and Jabril al Mawi in custody after anti-terror raids in Sydney's West. Quote, actually I'm not going to quote from that because the, the text of the article is almost identical to the one I quoted just before. They're both from AAP, a newswire. What is interesting is a set of photos used in the Daily Telegraph article. Now the Daily Telegraph is of course the big tabloid in Sydney, our largest city. It's one of the biggest newspapers in this country. The article shows two officers decked out in full tactical gear, balaclavas, helmets, body armour, and submachine guns holding one of the accused up against a brick wall, while the other two, uh, while the other photo shows a Lenko Bearcat, which is the seven-ton armoured personnel carrier that the police now have at the scene of the arrests. And this reveals to me the true nature of these terror raids and the reportage of them, normalising the use of tactical teams for regular arrests, i.e. militarisation of our police, and blurring of the lines between standard criminal offences and so-called terrorism, mm-hmm. so that any enemy of the state can be raided, treated, and reported as a terrorist. 
and I'll conclude with these thoughts on this topic. These developments ought to be most concerning to anybody with a functioning brain, especially those with children who will grow up under a militarized police state. If we the people don't begin to resist, intellectually, if not physically, the strong mainstream media and government push we are currently witnessing. Ethan, uh, what say you? Uh, it's just It just repeats itself over and over. It goes in cycles, and it's the people... It resonates in their mind for a short time, then they move on to the next issue, and that may be gone. But it's been it's been programmed into their subconscious. All of these, all of these, all of the programming that they want to do, as John had just mentioned, the militarization of police for standard arrests, uh, the, the borderline between uh, terrorism and common criminal arrests. Um, it just seems like they are just doing this uh, just to push an agenda forward, and then once it's revealed that. You know, no one has been charged with terrorism as the first wave did. No one's going to report on that because they've already got their agenda through. What do you think, Zach? I think it's pure intimidation. That's what I think. I think they're just letting you know that they have the power to do whatever they want to you. It's pretty clear to me. And they're just programming into your mind, as you were saying, that they're the police and you do what they say and you have to comply. And they have the force and the power to stop you if you resist. Absolutely. And I, this is what I wonder. If you could go back in time, say you could go back to the mid-1990s, right, for argument's sake, and show people a newspaper with photos of a Lenko Bearcat, a seven-ton armoured personnel carrier, and police decked out in tactical gear raiding a house for having illegal firearms. If you were to show that to someone of this country from 20 years ago, what do you think they would say? <laughs> it's outrageous. Yeah. They'd say, "What on? Hold on. What happened? What happened to Australia? What, what which, happened to Australia? That which war is this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because it takes time for people's freedoms to be taken away, and they're doing it step by step. Exactly. But what I find interesting is how quickly they're ramping this up at the moment. I mean, yeah. even three or four years ago, the idea of tactical teams being used as regularly as they are right now, I think, still would have been an affront to most people. But what they've done is they've hit us one, two, three, four with the fake ISIS beheadings, Tony Abbott talking about raising the terror level, the Newman Hader event, which, as one of our listeners, I think it was uh, Raw Sash in the chat box said, was a complete PSYOP staged event, which I agree 100%. It was, it's funny how in this country, they don't even have to release any real footage of the incident. They can just put it on the news and say, well, this happened and people believe it. Mm. At least in Canada and other countries, they have to provide fake footage that we can then debunk. In, a, <laughs> in, in Australia, they don't even provide fake footage. They don't have to. They can yeah. just say... A Muslim kid tried to behead a police officer at a police station when he was with another police officer when they had guns and he thought he'd get away with it. And we've got zero footage of it, zero evidence. We're just going to tell you, most Australians believe that nonsense. Well, don't you worry, Raw Sash, you've come to the right place here. <laughs> I can't speak for the other two dudes on the panel, but I never believed that for a second. But the point is, you add all of this up together and all of a sudden you have bear cats and tactical gears walking down the street. And the people just cop it because they've been conditioned. That's what the television mm. is. It's conditioning. It's programming. And unfortunately, we're surrounded in every direction by people who are 100% programmed. School also teaches you that as well. Absolutely. To accept authority. Yep. To follow orders without question. Yeah. No, it's exactly right. It, from The whole system has been constructed to get them young, just yeah. as George Orwell's Animal Farm yeah. pointed out it's the same ideology and for those that somehow miraculously make it through the system and then realize then they become isolated because they feel like they're, they're uh, different from what yeah. the accepted norms are and that's where communities like this is so important to make people realize you're not alone out there and more and more each and every day around the world are starting to see this false illusion we're living in and that's exactly why these kinds of podcasts even though this one is still small right now i mean we've got about 30 live listeners which i'm ecstatic with so thank you everyone for spreading the word <laughs> about the show i think last week's show got about 600 700 total downloads the one before that got up to a 1,000. So even this show, which started a few months ago, we started getting a good following. Then you got the ones in America that started to get even bigger followings than that. More people are starting to do this work. And of course, on last week's We'll Do It Live, we discussed the France incident because it was taking place pretty much as we went to air. And what happened to that uh, particular episode? It was taken off YouTube. Had to be reloaded elsewhere. Now, why would they take that discussion down? Well, they'll give any reason they can, but they don't want people discussing these kinds of things, and they especially don't want people discussing the countries that are involved, and we'll get to all of that later in the show. But the point I'm trying to make here is what we're doing right now is very dangerous to the establishment because, as you said, Ethan, they rely on the people who wake up, which will always be some people who do, 
being all alone. Well, now they're not alone. They've got this show every Sunday. They've got other shows during the week. They can make their own shows. This is powerful stuff, and it's why we love having new people on the panel like yourself, Zach, to Thanks. join us. <laughs> I think that power comes from the ignorance of the masses, and if that huge mass of people is enlightened, I think their power will diminish. Uh, absolutely, and I mean, Silver Slave in the chat box just a moment ago asked the question, if people started switching off their televisions, not giving their money to the state, how long would it take before the whole thing collapses? Well, I'm glad he asked that question. I read a thing in, I think it was the Washington Post just a week or two ago, a study that looked at how governments are deposed by their people, and it found two key findings. I don't have it in front of me, but I'll just give the basics of what I remember. The two key findings were this. One, if it's a concerted effort where the people involved genuinely do what they can, not to violently overthrow the government, but just to stop giving their money, to stop giving their labor, to stop giving their assent. To stop supporting. Only, to stop supporting only takes about 3.5% of mm. the population, right? 3.5% of people who are committed to doing something is all it takes to get something done. The yeah. second point I found was that nonviolent revolution, if you want to use that word, was far more effective than violent revolution, which is why I always make the point, it doesn't matter how angry you get at our corrupt, sick, disgusting government, and that's natural to get angry at it once you realize just how sick and corrupt and disgusting it is. But anger isn't the answer. The answer is spreading the word, spreading the message, getting people to wake up to it, because once enough of us do, it's game over. Yeah, game violence over. is never the answer. Never the answer. Now, unless we have anything more to add on the terror raids, we'll move on to our next topic. Now, this is one that I've been looking forward to all week and is the reason why we pushed climate change back, and that is because... There's a massive anti-vaccine debate taking place in this country right now, Ethan. And this is a topic that I know is close to your heart. You follow it closely. Take it away and, and let us know what you've got on this topic. Yeah, definitely. Well, vaccines are back as a hot topic in the Australian press at the moment, which they haven't been for a consider considerable amount of time, actually. I think we've only briefly touched on it here on the Australian Roundtable in various you know, related conversations of state control over every facet of life. Uh, but they're back again, and as usual, the pro-vaccine lobby is in full swing to silence, any, silence anyone that speaks out in opposition to vaccination. And this time, it's Dr. Sherry Tenpenny from the United States, who was, and I still believe is, set to do some tours over here in Australia in March to educate the public about the dangers of vaccination and government agendas. Dr. Uh, Tenpenny obviously is prominent over in the US as an anti-vaccinator, -vac uh, campaigner and she's she's written a number of books so it's been all over the news this week because it started with a an, an abc report i believe where they were they were talking about the dangers of vaccine and um i think sorry i lost my train of thought there thinking about that i'll just read an article from the city morning herald this week from january 8th a prominent u.s anti-vaccination campaigner sherry tenpenny has had her sydney and melbourne shows cancelled after widespread community backlash the Carilla golf club in sydney south cancelled dr tenpenny's show on wednesday after it found out her subject matter was to be quote too controversial the decision comes after melbourne bay's melbourne's bay View Eden Hotel also cancelled her seminar following a protest by doctors at the venue decision to host the controversial speaker. The shows were obviously set to take place in March, as I mentioned. Uh, the prominent anti-vaccine campaigner Stephanie Messenger, who lives in Brisbane and was responsible for bringing her out, I believe, and the organiser of the Birth and Beyond Baby Tour said the decision sets a, quote, very dangerous precedent. It is sad that they have that they have to give into bullying. They don't believe in freedom of speech. Parents have the right to know all sides of the debate, Mr. Me Mrs. Messenger said. And that's the real issue here, guys. Not whether you're pro-vaccination or against it. It's all about freedom to present both sides of the spectrum and to make educated and informed decisions about whether or not you want to vaccinate your child. Now, I've made a video in the past about this at my YouTube channel at TOTT News when the media was presenting the notion that those who choose not to vaccinate their children should be held accountable for child abuse. If you recall last year, that was happening here in the country. And in this video, I say the exact same thing. I also present a number of alternatives to vaccines to help build the immune system in a 21st century environment, of course, for those who want to rebuttal the child safety argument. And I also dispelled some of the myths surrounding vaccines in the country. And we don't have time to go into all of that the, you know, the pros and cons of vaccination. But I encourage everyone to check that video out and I'll leave, as always, a link uh, in the info box at our website, osroundtable.com. But the basic premise I was pointing to 
was that if government is allowed through manipulation or public ignorance, whatever it is, to tell you what to do with your child, that sets an unimaginable precedent. State-enforced policy, particularly on personal health, should be a concern for anyone in this country and needs to be addressed because when I've spoken to people about this, most are unaware of the underlying issue here. They get so caught up in their personal opinion and emotional attachment to the child safety narrative that they are prepared to say the things they do to reassure their program perception without seeing the hidden agenda. And when you break down the conditioning to people and explain to them that anti-vaccinated campaigners aren't trying to tell you what to do, rather they're advocating for free choice from the state. Most that I've spoken to no longer see them as the enemy and agree that free choice is essential. And they don't see that uh, because they see us as the enemy because the media are responsible for that. And Jono, I know you've got a video there speaking about the media. I can't wait to show you that video. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. When you bring that up to people, that so-called anti-vaxxers aren't saying that you can't get your kid vaccinated, just <laughs> saying that you should have the choice whether your kid gets vaccinated, you say that that gets a good uh, response from people. Do you get many people bringing up the whole herd immunity argument to you? Yeah, that's that's every single time that's what happens. And, you know, you can rebuttal them with simple questions like, well, if you're worried about your kid and my kid not being vaccinated, yet the vaccines are supposed to work, you have nothing to worry about. Mm. And then they'll say to you, oh, and this I'm just playing devil's advocate here, Ethan, because <laughs> Raw Sash in the live uh, conversation, live chat right now, says that he's on the fence with this debate. Yep. And I'll get to my position in a moment. But going back to the herd immunity thing, th these people say to you, oh, but herd immunity only works if your kid gets vaccinated too. Otherwise, your kid is a risk. What do you say to that? Herd immunity only works if, yep. Um, I say it at the end of the day, if you want to be pro-vaccination, good on you. You know what I mean? If you want to vaccinate your kids, you want to do that, good on you. But it, you shouldn't be able to impose on someone else's free choice. And mm. furthermore, you shouldn't be able to, to uh, campaign for the state to then make that decision for you. Kevin Rudd, when he was campaigning to get elected, was threatening to cut family tax benefits. In New South Wales now, childcare centres, you're not allowed in childcare centres if you haven't been vaccinated. It's all about um, free choice. And if you're pro-vaccine and you're worried about people that, you know, spread flyers, try to educate your family, friends and members that are. But going on a hate campaign, as all of these politicians and all of these people are doing, is not the answer because there's an underlying issue here and it's state control. Because if the state can get away with this now, what can they get away with in the future? If you can't even make the decision about your own child, about what you give them on a public health level, then that just sets an unbelievable precedent. And it's not only that you can't decide, or these people don't want you to be able to decide, they don't even want to allow into the country someone who argues mm. that you might be better off without it. And that's really where I come into this discussion. I, I'll be perfectly honest, I haven't spent the time researching vaccinations, as I have, said with fluoride. We discussed fluoride. I'm more than happy to say, yeah, that shouldn't be in our drinking water. I'm going to try and get it out of my drinking water. I don't think they should be put in anybody's drinking water. If it's going to be put in people's drinking water, we should have a public debate about it. And if the majority want it, then let the majority put it in their own water. But if it has to be done through everyone's water, then let's have a vote on it first. Exactly. That's what I say, because I've looked into the science behind fluoride and the science is conclusive yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you go to wikipedia and just read the first page of wikipedia you'll think that the science is on the side of fluoridation but as we all know wikipedia is 100 percent compromised that's why people like me call it xyopedia it's not there for your benefit it's just another propaganda tool of the establishment if you look on say the discussion page of fluoride and look at all the studies that are linked there but aren't allowed to get to the front page then you'll see the science is in Fluoride is not a good thing. In fact, it's probably detrimental. I'm happy to say that. With the vaccination debate, I can't claim to have the same knowledge. I haven't looked into the science as far. But what I do know is this. People should have the right to decide what gets injected into their kids, and they should especially have the right to listen to somebody who only has ideas and opinions to offer. Yeah. If you can't have that, you don't have anything close to a liberal democracy, and you should stop pretending otherwise. And in the live chat, Die Man, who's one of my favorite commenters, said, no other group embody tyranny quite so well as pro-vaxxers. 
And I couldn't agree with him more. Absolutely. When you look at the pro-vaxxers and how rabid they get on this topic, it's clear. This is more than a, an a intellectual debate for these people. In fact, for them, there's no intellectual debate. It's 100% emotional. Absolutely, and I'm, yes. And once we've got Zach's opinions, I'm going to play a video that shows that. But Zach, before I do, let's get your general opinion on this topic. I've been sitting here waiting to talk. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think the crux of the issue is not about whether vaccines are good or bad. That's not what this story is about. This story is about should someone be allowed to talk about something you don't agree with? Of course they should be. That's what freedom is. And how do you know you disagree with them if you don't even let them talk? Uh, that's a fantastic point. And um, it was raised. It was just like this pick, recent pickup artist situation where the Australian government declined the visa because of his the outpour about his controversial tactics to seduce women or whatever his show may be and it's not about whether you agree with him or not i personally don't agree with him but it's about having the right to say that i will defend his right to be able to free speech that but i won't you know i won't support him and that was back i think episode six or seven so we've got a lot of new listeners since then basically here in australia we had a so-called pickup artist who was coming to do a few events on our eastern seaboard and there was a large media campaign a mainstream media campaign to have this guy's visa revoked, to not let him come and give speeches about being a pickup artist because supposedly this was promoting violence against women. That's what actually happened in this country. There were people saying, don't let this guy come to give speeches because we don't like what he's going to preach. And we said at the time, hey, this is a little bit concerning, don't you think, that they want to ban people for their ideas? Don't you see where this is going to lead? And here we are just a couple of months later, and sure enough, they want to ban someone else for their ideas. Now, many of our listeners are wondering, well, hold on, how, how could people be so rapidly pro-vaccination? I mean, how... Just how much control does the media have of the minds over there in this country? Well, let me play you a clip from the project. Now, we have three commercial broadcasters in this country, 7, 9, and 10. And 10 has this 7 p.m. project that is targeted at a younger demographic, say people in their 20s and 30s, as like a substitute for the news. It's like news otainment. They get on a whole bunch of B and C grade comedians and celebrities to supposedly present and discuss the news. It's on weekly, I think. It might even be a one-hour show now. I I don't watch enough TV to know, okay? <laughs> but that's the basic background. This is a segment that they did on this exact topic mm. of Dr. Terry Tenpenny. I'm going to play this for the audience right now. I think it's a four-minute clip, so please bear with us. But you have to understand that this is what's not just being passed off as news that many people in this country actually believe. Calls to ban a prominent anti-vaccine campaigner from entering the country. Made a foreign speaker is coming to Australia to spread dangerous lies to a vulnerable public. But Sherry Tenpenny's no terrorist. She's an anti-vaccination campaigner. Here's why many Aussies want to keep her out of the country. This woman and the groups that she's associated with are quite simply a danger to Australian lives and particularly a danger to the lives of Australians' children. Let's be really clear. There's no evidence that vaccines cause any condition or illness. And there's abundant evidence that vaccines have saved hundreds of millions of lives. This is one of those... Now, I hate to pause these clips while I'm playing them, but just for the listeners at home who couldn't see that, when she said, let's be abundantly clear, there's no evidence, they overplayed a, a graphic which showed uh, all the nasty little things that the vi that uh, vaccination supposedly stopped, right? Then when she said there is evidence that it helps, they actually had purple love hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and Zach's going, did they really? I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, let's play that bit again. Seriously, watch this. Be really clear. There's no evidence that vaccines cause any... See, there's all the nasties. And there's abundant evidence that vaccines have saved hundreds of lives. <laughs> this is one of those cases where, on the one hand, you've got science, and on the uh, other hand, there really isn't another hand. We know uh, from years and years of research... So she just said, on the one hand, we've got science, and on the other hand, there isn't another hand. <laughs> she needs to go back to Anatomy 101. There's thousands of publications that vaccines are overwhelmingly safe and effective. But if the science is so clear, why are science advocates afraid to let anti-vaccination campaigner Sherry Tenpenny speak? When you're a new parent, you are very vulnerable to the information that's out there because you really do want to do the best by your child. Of course, parents have the right to be concerned about a medical procedure, but overwhelmingly, they need access to accurate science-based information, and this is not what they will get from Dr. Tenpenny. The problem with Tenpenny's message is it doesn't <laughs> <Evil> just... <music. laughs> 
<laughs> Could they be any more blatant? Detectives follow it. Vaccine no. refusal leads to dangerous outbreaks. Just today we learned two children and a 35-year-old man contracted measles at a Melbourne graduation ceremony. The Minister for Immigration has the right to refuse entry into this country for someone who might pose a danger to our society. And that is exactly what this woman does. This is not so much an issue of freedom of speech, it's an issue of public health. And the people most at risk from this misinformation will be children who may get sick and in extreme cases could die. What do you think about letting her into the country? Okay, so what they just played was the pre-recorded clip showing so-called experts saying that vaccination is good, anti-vaccination is bad. Now they go to their panel of four people discussing, and most of our listeners aren't from Australia. They won't know who these people are, but you've got Peter Hellier, the so-called comedian there. Don't know who that guy is, uh, but I know that he's popular and well-known. What's her name? Uh, Carrie Bickmore. Carrie Bickmore. And then this clown, who I'm pretty sure also used to be a comedian. <laughs> I, look, I, I don't know. I don't watch enough TV. But anyway, it's the discussion part that really uh, got me uh, interested in this. They said it's not an issue of freedom of speech. Of course it's an issue of freedom of speech. That's the whole issue. That's that, why yeah. people are objecting. It's, That's right. It's complete false. That, that claim is just False, full stop. It's just complete propaganda. And I don't look up, we don't really have time to play all of this, but let me just play the first minute or two of this so called panel discussion on that topic. No, I, I don't think it's, I don't think she should come. I, that some people like, I've seen some people arguing on Facebook, this is free speech, you should be able to come and say, your free speech ends at the point that my kids could be dangerous. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so angry, it's such a first world issue. Like, there's, there's people in the third world that would do anything to have access to the vaccines that some people are going, oh, I don't know, they might cause, you know, autism when there is no proof that they cause autism. Like, there's nothing, there's no scientific evidence, as Jamila said there, but yet we allow the debate to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids don't get the vote, so we, we need to protect them. We need to risk more than anyone. Else, I mean, I don't, I don't have kids myself, but I made a compromise position. Say she can come on a boat, she'll never get here. <laughs> Yeah, that's said, the, that's allow the debate, yeah. as though that was a bad he, thing. I'm pretty sure he's supposed to be a comedian. Is that he Will is. Anderson? That's Will Anderson. Yeah, no, that's Will Anderson. He was the host of The Glass House. Yeah, and so what does he say? I don't have kids, but let me make a compromise position. Then he makes a joke about how our government doesn't let boat people come in, and that gets all the candle laughter. Now, I'm not going to watch a full episode of the, uh, the project, but this little clip that I saw, they didn't show any audience. So is this actually one of those shows that pretends to be a live show but still uses canned laughter? No, nah, they've got an audience. Have they got yeah, an audience? <laughs> Surprisingly. People, people actually go this. to this. Yeah, people buy <laughs> these tickets to go to this. And those people are telling us what we should put into our kids. Oh, it's, that, that clip just infuriated me. I haven't even seen that because I only watch the project on select occasions when you know they've got... Uh, people like Ewan Saunders from Brisbane talking about civil liberties and stuff on some good work that they do. Mm. Uh, but that was just unbelievable. Can you believe that, Zach? Well, it's this weird twisted train of thought that goes something like this. Um, people are ignorant and stupid, so they'll believe anything that some person comes and tells them, and they might hurt themselves or others. So we need to protect them from this person who's presenting their argument, whether it's true or false, scientifically backed or not, and yet the issue of freedom of speech never comes up because they stop that person from even presenting their argument. How can you know what they're going to present if you haven't even heard their argument? And it, it, ABC, I was appalled with ABC on their Facebook page uh, this week. They, they posted up referring back to that bogus autism study that was released that, um, that they used as a basis and it was proven wrong that there was no link between autism. Anti-vaxxers are not talking about autism. That's old news. They, no anti-vaccination campaign is a saying there's a link between autism. There's links between all other things. There's links between, um, a, a whole lot of neurological, um, Problems which I've experienced in my family with people that have got vaccinations, uh, cousins that have been eight, nine, that have got vaccinations were perfectly healthy kids and then have got it and then all of these neurological effects have started to take place where their bones have started to, you know, their bones have started to hurt, their, 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 their vision started to be impaired, all of these things and there's all of these signs. So when we actually go into this, I'm going to just absolutely refute everything that they said because mm. that infuriated me i don't have the the facts in front of me today because the main issue i was trying to speak on was that this same this sets a dangerous precedent because um sets a dangerous precedence because we know where this is going people like 
you, me, Jono, um, our listeners, and many other people can see that this is going well beyond the demonizing anti-vaccination campaigners, and it's going to a level that threatens the right to express in its very foundation. And that's the most important part. Our civil liberties to express ourselves are being diminished on a daily basis, and people with their ignorance, herd ignorance, based on the mainstream media, are using this, and they don't realize that pro-vaccination, uh, pro-vaccinations are as much a catalyst for the tyranny that's upcoming for the suppression of freedom of speech as anyone else. Well, let's just do a thought experiment, okay? Let's say vaccinations were 100% beneficial. Is it a bad thing? Do you want a society that allows people to object and to say what they want to say? What would you prefer? That's right. Well, that, that's a good thought experiment for us, Zach, because we would say, well, let the people decide. The problem that we have is I think even if you could show the masses who watch this kind of nonsense on Channel 10, even if you could show them that there was a 1% or 2% number of people who were negatively affected by the vaccines over the course of their life, and of course, people are now are getting dozens of vaccinations. Like Little children now are getting dozens of different vaccinations mm. by the time they're an so adult. over 30. Yeah, which I didn't realize until I started doing research for this segment, and I, I didn't do... Uh, a terrible amount of research because I knew that you would come here with yours, but I did just enough to give me the basics on what was being discussed. And I found out that, yeah, there's literally dozens of vaccinations being given to every little human that's born in this country now. So as long as its parents, uh, you know, don't object to it, dozens of vaccinations. Now, if you could convince uh, even your regular person on the street who watches the, the 7 pm project that even when it had a 1% or 2% negative effect on people, whether that's as extreme as autism or as, you know, minor as an illness for a week or two or whatever, even if you could convince them of that, I think the majority would still say no. You should be forced to get vaccinations. Your kids should have to be vaccinated to be with my kids. Such is the strength of drumming this idea into people's heads that we should force people to get vaccinated. And if you watch that clip that I just put up there, and I'll put a link in our description box as I always do, so people can watch that full clip for themselves, because that was just half of it. It gets worse from there. They, they strike on all the typical tactics that they have in these kinds of shows, where one of the people say it's a matter of danger, it's dangerous to let them come here. One of the people says, oh, it's a first world problem, why are we discussing this? Let's discuss something else. One of the people says, think of the children. <laughs> and then one of the person tries to put in a, a stupid joke and make the people laugh. Like, you couldn't script that any more ideally for the agenda that they're trying to push. Mm. And there's a reason that they're doing that because those scumbags, whether or not they would ever get their own kids vaccinated, they're not paid to have a real discussion. They're paid to sit there, look pretty, look suave, look smart, sound funny, and make you believe X, Y, or Z. And on that particular segment, X, Y, or Z was you have to get vaccinated. You shouldn't have a right to free speech. People shouldn't be able to come to this country with their own views. Government comes first. That's what they're paid to say, so they'll say it. And that's why I say that when things get better which I believe they will, people like these people will be put on trial for what they've done. That's high treason as far as I'm concerned. To sit there and pretend like you're giving people the truth when really you're spitting out propaganda, if that's not treason, I don't know what is. And Carrie Bickmore, Will Anderson, Peter Hellyer, and the other tool who was on that panel, I don't even know who you are. That's how C-grade you are. I don't know who you people are, but you people are doing something wrong to this country and eventually everybody's going to know it. Fantastic. Yeah. Think about the implication of that though. That... They assume the public is so stupid that one person coming in and just presenting the other side of an argument will, what, convince everyone? If people were well-educated, then you wouldn't need to worry about that, right? Yeah. Think about it. Well, they got upset because her shows were sold out. Yeah. And they, that raised concern because they said, hang on, there's people that actually want the other side of the story to be educated and informed. Yeah. Demonized, demonized, demonized. The Today Show pulled her interview this morning from Isn't... their YouTube channel. The producers and everything she said on her Facebook page have been coming up to her after the show and saying, yeah, I, I believe what you're saying. You know, my kids have been affected by it, but, you know, we can't say anything. We just yeah. have to serve Is it. Is it a bad thing to hear both sides of an argument? How can you possibly make up your mind about an issue unless you've heard both sides? Well, it, don't you understand, Zach? In this one, there aren't two sides. On the one hand, you have science. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand... There isn't another hand. <laughs> <laughs> These people are a joke. And look, we covered on last week's show, I think it was the Ash experiments and their relevance to this, how the television will intentionally vox pop three or four people all spouting the same nonsense, or they have a panel with three or four people all spouting the same nonsense because humans are naturally trained, whether it's uh, 
a physiological thing or a social conditioning thing. Either way, humans naturally follow the herd, even with opinions. Mm. So that's why they have their panel, to spout their nonsense propaganda. In fact, I think that's the whole idea of the 7 p.m. project, to make it seem like this is a more commonly held view. So no matter what propaganda they're pushing on whatever episode it is that they're doing, people are more likely to follow it, which is the power of this kind of roundtable, where, hey, uh, Zach comes into the show today. I don't even know exactly what Zach's going to think about this issue, but I do know that he thinks. So Mm. we can get him on the panel, (laughs) ask him, what do you think and what do you know? He says, whether you agree with vaccination or not, people should have a right to hear the different arguments. That's what this whole show is about. That's the opposite of what the 7 p.m. project is about. They're all going to parrot whatever they're told to parrot. Yeah. Well, I have no opinion, really, because I have no kids personally, and I haven't done a lot of research into the actual science behind vaccinations. But that's not what this story is about to me. This story is about, are you willing to let people hear the other side of the story? That's right, yeah. And well, the, I'll tell you someone who's listening to our side of the story, and that is Gary Mac and Tenaist, a new listener to the show. He just posted, hello from Sydney. Hello to you, Gary. Good to have you on board. We're up to 35 live listeners, which is a new record. So, Zach, the people are coming, mate. <laughs> <laughs> They've heard that Zach's on the show and they want to listen to you. I'll be back. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the next topic now, if that's cool with you guys. Yep. And that is the Paris incident. Now, we're going to break this down into two parts. The first will be the Australian coverage of the incident, which will round out our domestic segment today. And then we'll move on to the international segment where we'll just talk about the Paris incident itself. So we'll get straight into it. First up, if you're right with that, Ethan, I'll just leave this one with the Australian coverage of the Paris event. Last week, I detailed how Uncle Rupert's News Corp was running its terrorizing agenda of claiming that more lone wolves were roaming Australia's streets ready to attack. And we made the point that if terrorism is about striking fear into the populace and we were serious about wiping out terrorism, we would just start by wiping out the mainstream media. Terror would disappear overnight, except for any prostitute who had sold their soul and integrity to file copy for a news outlet that which they knew was garbage. They would have every right to be terrified because the people would be coming for them. In a better world, they'd be put on trial for their treason. From editor all the way down to intern, anybody who takes part in the mainstream media campaign to scare the citizens of this country into giving away their civil liberties ought to answer charges of treason. Now, of course, News Corp publishes about two-thirds of the newspapers bought and sold in this country every day. That's Uncle Rupert's News Corp, and most of the rest are published by Fairfax. So to further demonstrate how the mainstream media are all colluding to propagate this false terrorism scare, let's take a look at an article from The Age in Melbourne, dated yesterday and still prominent in their online copies today. This is from Nick Miller, their European correspondent who's in France. The title of the article is New Norm of Terror No One Ever Gets Used To As Terrorism Stakes Its Claims On Our Lives, January 10, 2015. Quote, The past three days in Paris have been extraordinary, but in the wake of all this blood and grief, in a glass half empty moment, I wonder if it's the new ordinary. Later in the article, he says, From there, the day developed with bewildering speed. Our, uh, sorry, one hostage crisis was joined by another. The link between the two and the death of, an, of a policewoman the day before was laid bare, and the depth of Al Qaeda's involvement in all this was exposed. <laughs> Terrorism chooses its targets to amplify its impact. This week was an attack at the heart of culture and democracy, just as 9 11 hit capitalism's temple. However, it's not over. After this, After Martin Place, after 2013's murder of Lee Rigby on the streets of London, this is how terrorism works. It is not just about grand plans and coordinated conspiracies. It can be one man or a terror cell. It can be intricately planned or a chaotic mess. It can be a suicide attack or a cynical strike. This is how it is. End quote. (laughs) Now, in this one article, the writer manages to tie the current France incidents up alongside the so-called Sydney siege, the Lee Rigby incident in London, and even 9-11 and claim that this is the new normal. So you see, our entire newspaper sector is on board with this phase of terrorizing the community. So people have two choices. Believe that there is a genuine and immediate threat of Islamic terrorist violence in this country, which the MSM is just reporting on, or you accept that the mainstream media is colluding with the government to strike fear into the masses so that they more eagerly support the passage of Ukrainian laws and more taxpayer-funded wars. Those are the only explanations for this full court press we are seeing from both sides of our newspaper duopoly in this country. Now, we've spent a lot of time on this show, especially episodes 1, 2, and 3, breaking down the new anti-terror laws in this country, introduced and or passed within days of the Newman-Hader event 
false flag hoax. Ethan, your coverage in particular was better than anything offered in the mainstream media. And any new listeners to the show, I recommend you go back and listen to those segments on episodes one, two, and three of this show to get an idea of just how draconian these laws are in this country today. Make no mistake, we are living in Stasi, Germany, but without the booming economy that Hitler created in order to make up for it. (laughs) I'm serious. Now, uh, this is an article from Nine News. New Australian anti-terror laws vital in fighting Paris-style attacks. Brandis, 10 January 2015. George Brandis, of course, being our Governor General, the one at the heart of those laws that I just discussed. Quote, As the world reels from the Parisian terror shootings, Attorney General George Brandis has announced new anti-terror laws are coming into effect in Australia this week will help keep the country safe from similar attacks. Senator Brandis said the Paris attacks were an assault on freedom of expression. <laughs> oh, my God. Freedom of expression. Sorry, when I was writing this one, uh, I didn't notice. Okay, that's funny. Back to the article. Uh, the lifeblood of free societies. <laughs> the legislation recently passed by the parliament has strengthened our ability to arrest, monitor, investigate, and prosecute returning foreign fighters and anyone who facilitates or supports that activity, he said in a statement. Under the new laws, returned fighters who have intentionally been in a declared area face a maximum 10-year jail sentence, among many other things. A new offence, advocating terror, prohibits promoting or encouraging terrorism and carries a maximum five-year sentence. Control orders can now be sought if a court is satisfied the order would assist the prevention of a terrorist act or where a person is engaged in hostile activities overseas or participated in training with a listed ter- terrorist organisation. Lower arrest thresholds mean the police can arrest somebody suspected of being involved in terrorism on reasonable suspicion, which Mr. Brennis claims would allow law enforcement to disrupt plots at an earlier stage. And quote, and again, as always, all of these links will be provided on OzRoutTable.com, and I recommend people check them out for themselves. Now, you see that the mainstream media will willingly push this notion at any opportunity available to suggest that the new laws are required to protect us from terrorism. And this is one reason why it is so obvious this is all part of a bigger plot. An event happens in Sydney, it is breaking news in all Five Eyes Nations. An event happens in Canada, it is breaking news in all Five Eyes Nations. An event happens in France, it is breaking news in all Five Eyes Nations. And each time, the relevant mainstream media uses it to push more fear of terrorism and more support of draconian anti-terror laws in their own countries. Now, that's my primer on the Australian coverage of the Paris event. We'll get to the greater Paris event discussion later, but before we do... The coverage that you guys have seen here in Australia of the Paris event, what do you think? It's just the same regurgitated propaganda that Australian media has been pumping out ever since the Sydney siege and ever before that. You know, it's it, it it's almost like they followed the same structure, the same script, and just change a couple of words. They changed Sydney siege with the Paris shootings. You know what I mean? The Paris situation. Um, Zach, I know you would have seen the media and their coverage of this. What did you think? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) It's just the same stuff regurgitated again and again. It's clearly fabricated. It clearly has an agenda behind it. Mm. Well, the first thing I saw is I saw that it was going on at the moment. And the first thing that popped up on my uh, feed of news was from Press TV, Mm. which Press TV have done some great work. I believe they're out of Iran, I believe. I'm not too sure on that. Uh, but if, immediately the article was titled something along the lines of, you know, it was a false flag attack, claims yeah. uh, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. And it, I'll read just a little bit from it because this was the first um, news that I was presented to. And then um, after that, I saw the, the, the propaganda mainstream media in Australia and just how sickening it was. So a former White House official says the terrorist attack that killed 12 people on Wednesday in Paris was a false flag operation, quote, designed to shore up France's vassal status to Washington. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, who is Assistant Secretary of the Treasury in the Reagan administration and Associate Editor of Wall Street Journal, made the remarks in an article published on Thursday, quote, The suspects can be both guilty and patsies. Just remember all terrorist plots created by the FBI that serve to make terrorism threat real to Americans, he wrote. He added, the CIA has apparently resurrected a policy that it followed against Europeans during post-World War II era when the US spy agency would carry out attacks in European states and blame them on communist groups. Dr. Roberts said, now the US agencies have planned false flag operations in Europe to create hatred against Muslims and bring European countries under Washington's sphere of influence. So right off the bat, 
real news. The first thing I saw was real news that was actually examining and actually presenting a different side of the story. It's refreshing, isn't it? It was so refreshing. That's why I'm so excited right now. <laughs> I didn't have to go through two days of Channel 9's non-stop coverage and analysis before I discovered this article, Jono. <laughs> Uh, wow. Well, yeah, so for international listeners who aren't aware, this France incident has been uh, leading news for the first couple of days that it took place, just as the Sydney siege was leading news for the first couple of days that that happened. And of course, the Sydney siege was leading news you know, in the Five Eyes nations and certain European nations as it happened, being the exact same thing for us with this France event. And what we're trying to do is establish the fact that our media and our government, George Brandis, Attorney General George Brandis, mm. is using this event to further their own agendas Terrible. already. Yeah, that was terrible. Brandis, Brandis saying that that's just the final straw was with him, in my opinion. Oh, man. Oh, you still had a little bit of hope for him, did you? Oh, <laughs> saying that it, 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 it's, it expresses you know freedom of speech and whatnot, these draconian laws that have taken away all our rights could land me in prison for 10 years for reporting on what ASIO does. No, disgusting parasite that should be held for treason as soon as possible. Absolutely. And I'll stop there. And uh, <laughs> Lenny Leverhume, one of our new listeners, has just come up with another thing. He says that he always walks around armed with a pea shooter in case more terrorists with plastic swords come along for him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the beautiful thing. So many people are waking up to the scam and it becomes a, an amusing thing. At first, you might be a little bit angry or despondent that you're being lied to so much. But very quickly, the smart man moves on to saying, well, let's, let's take the piss out of this. I mean, really, yeah. we can either sit here and laugh or cry. Let's laugh about it. And that's the best way to get other people on board. Yeah. People don't want to join a conspiracy theorist who is always angry and scared and uh, paranoid. No, they like a guy who says, hey, I don't believe what I'm told unless you give me evidence. And the evidence they've given me is laughable. Ha, ha, ha. That's the kind of person people want to join. People who are fun and, and taking this for what it is, which is a joke that's being played on us. Well, we can't be in on the joke, but we can still laugh along at the people who don't get it yet. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Now, that is the domestic coverage of the uh, France incident taken care of. Now, we're going to move on to what I know all the listeners are looking forward to, which is us covering the incident itself. And I can see in the live chat box, some of our listeners have already moved on to that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> they don't care about the Australian coverage. All right, let's do it now. The Paris event is what I'm calling it because I'm an event skeptic, as you know, which we all should be skeptical of everything, especially these events. The Paris event, I want to throw straight to you, Ethan, and you tell me what you think about what you saw, what you first saw, the red flags that you might have seen, etc. Mm. Yeah, well, obviously, as it was happening, as I just mentioned, the first thing I saw was that article, and I it was beneficial in missing out on the Australian coverage, because once I saw that, I said, all right, I don't need to watch it to analyze it as much now, because there's actual media outlets reporting on it. But the first thing I saw was all of the videos that were released originally before they became edited. And straight from the get-go, there was questions to be asked. There was questions yeah. to be asked about um, all aspects of the video. Why were police seen in the video? Why were these edited out? Why did the news, re why did the news sites re-upload it? And straight off the get-go, this followed the exact same path that all... Uh, all incidents that have happened so far since we've started this podcast have taken, John. And that's why I threw it to you, because I want to know, what did you first see? What did mm. you first start questioning? Because it's right. got to the stage for me and a lot of people around the world now, Zach, that as soon as one of these incidents makes the mainstream news, our first thought is, well, based on recent history, this is probably another staged event. Mm. Not, I'm going to think it's a staged event straight away and look for evidence, just that's what we're probably looking at here. So I didn't even know the official death toll of this incident <laughs> until this morning when I started doing research for it. So it's probably worth giving the official story mm -hmm. so that we can then start picking it apart bit by bit. So here's the official story. On January 7, around 11.30 a.m., two masked gunmen entered the Charlie Hebdo offices with AK-47s shouting, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Charlie Hebdo is a weekly satirical newspaper. Gunman killed... By the way, that's the official story, guys. I'm just reading out the official story, okay? <laughs> that's, that's why the Allahu Akbar thing is funny to me. <laughs> okay, so gunman killed 12 people, including a number of Hebdo employees and two police officers. One of those officers was shot from point-blank range while lying on the ground. The gunman then fled the scene. A third suspect handed himself into police... And that happened live during the We'll Do It Live uh, episode that I mentioned earlier. Like, that actually happened while we were on air. Uh, that third suspect handed himself into police, and Australia found out about it before the rest of the world. Like, I was getting news on my computer before the people I was doing the show with, people based in Canada and the United States. I had that information before they did. Very interesting, isn't it? Anyhow, 
Uh, another gunman took hostages at a kosher supermarket near Port de Vincent. I think I'm pronouncing that properly. Police raids were conducted simultaneously on the two positions because one of the sorry the two uh, sh- sh- uh, gunmen were later tracked down to an industrial estate in De Martin and Goal, where they took a hostage. So they had two. There were two places now. De Mart- I've stuffed this up. This is why I should just stick to what I've written. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happened. Those two guys got tracked down to an industrial estate in De Martin on Goal, where they took a hostage, and another gunman took hostages at a kosher supermarket near Port de Vincent. Now, police raids were conducted simultaneously on the two positions. Three terrorists were killed in the raids, and several hostages were killed or injured. Four hostages had been killed in the supermarket, the kosher supermarket, before the raids took place. A total of 20 people, including three gunmen, are dead, and a fifth suspect is still on the run as we go to air. That's the official story. Now, the first red flag which gave this event away to me was the video footage of the police officer being shot while on the ground. Yeah. Now, if you haven't seen that yet, listeners, after the show, just go and look for it. I'm sure you'll still find it, whether it's on LiveLeak or another place. Usually, you can find these unedited videos uh, right from the start, just like with the Sydney Siege. The ones that are shown in the mainstream media, obviously, are heavily edited. They're blurred out, whatever. Go and find the original one and take a look for yourself. That video footage of the police shooting reveals no recoil, no impact on the alleged victim, and most importantly, no blood whatsoever. From a point-blank shot to the head from an assault rifle, and of course, the news agencies blurred the entire body out when showing this footage, but nobody who looks at the unblurred footage could argue that it is in any way realistic. The second major red flag which gives this away, Sky News released a video of a reporter at the alleged scene of the police shooting the next day. The scene is bound only by some shabby tape, not even police tape, but just like construction zone tape. Candles and flowers littered the alleged crime scene, and a pool of what is purported to be blood can be seen. The reporter says, quote, The spot where he fell has already been marked by candles, by some flowers which have been laid here. This area was largely cordoned off last night, so not many people could have come here, so there's not much sign of presence. You can see the blood on the ground which has been put there to because of the blood that was shed on this spot yesterday. As I said, it's still cordoned off, although the road has now been reopened and Paris is going about its business as normal. End quote. So then the footage shows people just driving by what should be a major crime scene, <laughs> protected only by like very shabby tape, not even police tape, and blood that the reporter himself says you can see the blood on the ground which has been put there to because of the blood that was shed on this spot yesterday. Now that doesn't make any sense, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have already seen that video, but for those who haven't, I am going to play that 90 second video before going on. Uh, with the rest of my segment here. So just bear with me. We'll play a 90-second video from Sky News the day the after. The shocking image which features on many of the front pages was that uh, terrible moment where the uh, officer who had been wounded by the two gunmen as they were making their escape was then uh, cold-bloodedly uh, finished off with uh, another shot. That's the spot where I'm standing now. Let me give you an idea of the geography because just over here, about 100 metres across the park and down that little side street there is where the offices of uh, Charlie Hebdo are. The gunmen appear to have carried out their deed, killing 10 people in that office and then made their getaway, initially going north on Boulevard Richard Lenoir And then, because of the one-way system which is operating here, then doubling back on themselves. And that's where they appear to have come across uh, the police officer who uh, was seen by them. And he opened fire, shot and wounded. And then he was then finished off. The spot where he fell has already been now marked by uh, candles, by some flowers which have been laid here. This area was largely uh, cordoned off. Uh, last night, so not many people could have come here, so there's not much sign of presence. You can see the, the blood on the ground, which has been put there too, because of the blood that was shed. All- so you heard that just then. That's not my editing. This is the original video. He says, the blood that's been put there to the blood that was shed yesterday. We'll play that again very quickly for the listeners. This is a, a key part of this whole story. He even says himself that that, gun, gun, that police officer that was shot was what was on the newspapers everywhere around the world. So by this guy's own admission, this is the key story to the whole narrative. Now let's hear him describe that blood once again, again, a day after the incident. Sign of presence, you can see the, the blood on the ground which has been put there too because of the blood that was shed on this spot uh, yesterday. As I say, this- So you can see that there's something wrong with his story and that in and of itself wouldn't be proof that this is a stage event, but you combine that with the fact that the video of the, government, of the police officer being shot shows no blood. Then suddenly we see that there is blood the guy saying that there's blood, the reporter, stumbles over his sentence and says that the blood was put there to 
because of the blood that was shed there yesterday. And then one little final piece to this little puzzle, which some of our live listeners have commented on while I was speaking, and that is that the section of blood that he refers to, no matter how it got there, is on a different part of the footpath to what the other video shows the policeman was laying on when he got shot. So for me, there's red flags one, two, and three. That scene is clearly staged. So you have to ask, if they staged that part of the event, which part is real? If you had a real event, why would you stage a part? You wouldn't. So obviously, to me, it's very clear, this is another staged event. Ethan, what say you? Well, obviously, more information is going to come out that we can pick this event apart as a whole. But right off the get-go, the first thing I saw was that supposed execution. And that was just ridiculous. That that wouldn't even pass as Hollywood style. I mean, the, the first of all, the, the gunman is running with an AK-47. As he's running, you know, lifts the gun up to shoot the supposed officer. No recoil on his arm, yep. which he's only holding with one arm, which you don't do with an AK-47. They're powerful weapons. Exactly. And he shoots, and all you see is this little dust near his head, like a recoil of the ground. No uh, no uh, movement of the body from the impact of the bullet. No blood. When you shoot someone at point blank range execution with AK-47, for those that have actually seen real ISIS executions from the actual extremists that have been funded in the Middle East, not the fake ISIS, the actual extremists <laughs> that have been let loose over there to, to topple Syria and all of these governments, um, when they do executions, not these fake beheading ones with tiny little knives, uh, you know, Jihadi John or whatever his name is, um, when you see that happen, you see... When you're executed at point black range with AK-47, half the head basically comes off. It's it's graphic stuff, but this is not what we've seen in the video, Zach. Yeah. Well, I think about who benefits from this. I mean, if this was staged, then why did they do it? And I'm going to allude to a point that Jono made earlier, which is they can arrest people with reasonable suspicion of being a terrorist. What is the definition of reasonable suspicion? That could be anything. That is so subjective, they could arrest anyone for suspicion of being a terrorist. And I think that's what this is all about. I think this is why they do these false flag attacks. And it's not, and it's not just uh, the loose definition of reasonable doubt. It's the loose definition of terrorism itself. Yeah. Books that have been published have said there are over nine... There are over 90 definitions of terrorism and there is no solid international definition of terrorism to be held in a court if all of these so-called terrorists were to be held by trial. It's funny how all of them die and no one's ever held accountable on trial. But if Mm. they were, there's no definition of terrorism to then justify the loose definition of reasonable doubt to arrest them. It's it's madness. Mm. It is madness, and already we've reached the end of what's supposed to be the 90 minutes of this show, so I'll leave this up to you guys. I'm happy to stay for the full two hours to go through the rest of what I've got here. Are you happy to stick around and make this another two-hour show? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the way. Excellent. Well, one more point. I know that Mr. 79 Savvy in the chat box mentioned the trolley. I'm not going to go too far down the rabbit hole in this episode, but it is interesting that in that video that we just discussed of the reporter talking about the blood that was put there or shed there, he doesn't know, there's a trolley within the crime scene that's being cordoned off. What on earth is the trolley doing there? Some people who are a bit further down the rabbit hole than this show plans to go would say, well, that's almost like predictive uh, forewarning for the fact that the next event was to take place at a supermarket. Now, that's not what I'm claiming, but I know that people in in the live chat box are, and it's an interesting rabbit hole to go down. The thing is, we don't need to go down any rabbit holes with this one. When you ask a good question, it's a good question to ask, Zach, who benefits? This is the question we should always ask. Queer bono, who benefits? Well... I'm going to read a couple of articles out here, and I'm going to let people connect the dots for themselves. I want to read an article from the uh, AFP via the Business Insider. Netanyahu warns of grave mistake if France recognizes Palestine. This is an article from the 23rd of November, 2014. This is a long quote, so listeners, please bear with me. Quote, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns Sunday that France's, France's parliament... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to stand a little bit more cultured on this episode. It's France, not France. Let's try that again. Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu warned Sunday that France's parliament would be making a grave mistake if it recognizes a Palestinian state in a vote on December 2. Quote, do they have nothing better to do at a time of beheadings across the Middle East, including that of a French citizen? 
he told reporters in Jerusalem, referring to Haika Herve Gurdel, who was executed by his jihadist captors in Algeria in September. Recognition of a Palestinian state by France would be a grave mistake, Netanyahu said. The state of Israel is a homeland of the Jewish people, the only state that we have, and the Palestinians demanding a state do not want to recognize the right to have a state for the Jewish people, Netanyahu told members of Israel's growing Jewish community from France. His comments came just hours after his cabinet voted 14-6 in favor of a controversial proposal to anchor in law Israel's status as the national homeland of the Jewish people. France's plans for a non-binding but highly symbolic vote follow similar resolutions passed by the British and Spanish parliaments and an official decision to recognize Palestine by the Swedish government. Sweden's move infuriated Israel, which responded by recalling its ambassador to Stockholm. A draft of the proposal in France invites the French government to use the recognition of the state of Palestine as an instrument to gain a definitive resolution of the conflict. European leaders have shown signs of mounting impatience with Israel over its continued sediment building on Palestinian land. Criticism has become more focused in the wake of this summer's 50-day offensive by the IDF in Gaza that killed about 2,200 Palestinians and dozens of Israelis. And quote. Now, that was from 23 November 2014. Let's fast forward, shall we, to 31 December 2014, so just a couple of weeks ago. This is from The Guardian. U.S. and Israeli intervention led U.N. to reject Palestinian resolution is the title of the article. I'll quote from it directly. Quote, the U.N. Security Council rejected a Palestinian resolution demanding an end to Israeli occupation within three years after Israel and the U.S. crucially intervened to persuade Nigeria to abstain from voting. Palestinian officials and other observers had thought Nigeria would back a Jordanian-tabled resolution thereby delivering a nine-vote majority on the council, which would have required a U.S. veto to be blocked. Washington had been working strenuously to avoid having to use its veto. Until shortly before the vote on Tuesday, council diplomats had expected the resolution to get nine yes votes, but Nigeria abstained, with its ambassador, Yu Joy Ogwu, echoing the U.S. position in saying that the path to peace lay in a negotiated solution. One Palestinian source involved in the negotiations told The Guardian, even if half an hour... Before the vote, Nigeria indicated it was committed to voting for the resolution. We knew that Rwanda, South Korea and Australia would not back it, but we believed Nigeria was on board. After the vote, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Avigdor Lieberman, took a swipe at the European countries which backed the resolution. The Palestinian disregard to the international community's most important countries, particularly the US, stems from the backing they received from certain European countries, he said. Palestinian and French officials indicated they would continue working to find a text to put to the council, perhaps within weeks, end quote. So just to recap there, and again, I apologize for the monotony, but this is all very important stuff. To recap there, Netanyahu said that it would be a grave mistake for France to back this resolution. France backed it anyway, which meant that the US had to convince Nigeria not to vote. Had Nigeria voted the way that uh, France and Palestine wanted, then they would have been given the statehood that they sought. So the US had to intervene because of countries like France doing what they were warned not to be a grave mistake by backing the resolution. Now I want to read out an article from the Jerusalem Post uh, entitled Netanyahu Louds US Australia for Efforts to Reject Palestinian UN Bid. This is also from 31 December 2014. This is a much shorter uh, passage. Please bear with me. Quote, the Palestinian resolution calling for a full Israeli withdrawal to the pre-1967 lines by 2017 and the establishment of a Palestinian state within East Jerusalem uh, with East Jerusalem as its capital, did not muster the necessary nine votes Tuesday in the Security Council. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday lauded the US and Australia for voting against the Palestinian UN Security Council draft resolution on Tuesday and praised Rwanda and Nigeria for abstaining. I want to express appreciation and gratitude to the US and Australia, as well as special appreciation to the President of Rwanda, my friend Paul Kagame, and to the President of Nigeria, my friend Good Luck Jonathan Netanyahu said when he arrived Wednesday morning to vote in the Likud primary. End quote. So here we have Netanyahu saying, I want to thank those who voted the way that we wanted them to vote, including obscure countries in Africa who <laughs> have nothing to do with Israel. That's following their warnings to the countries like France not to vote a certain way. Uh, One more article from The Guardian, and this is from the 8th of January 2015. Palestine to become a member of the International Criminal Court. Quote, the UN Security General Ban Ki-moon has confirmed that Palestine will officially become a member of the International Criminal Court on 1 April, the UN press office said on Wednesday. The Palestinians delivered documents to UN headquarters on Friday. 
to join the Rome Statute of the ICC and other international treaties in a move that has heightened tensions with Israel and could lead to cuts in US aid. The official announcement of the date of the Palestinian accession to the ICC in the form of a letter from Ban was posted on a UN website. Under ICC rules, Palestinian membership would allow the court, based in the Hague, to exercise jurisdiction over war crimes committed by anyone on Palestinian territory without a referral from the UN Security Council. Israel, like the United States, is not a party to the Rome Statute, but its citizens could be tried for actions taken on Palestinian land. The Palestinian government signed the statute on 31 December, a day after a bid for independence by 2017 failed at the UN Security Council. Council. Now, based on what I just read out, guys, have you been connecting any dots here? I connected the dots years ago, and now with this incident, um, it seems even more prevalent, and I've got a little bit to expand on that, Jono, if, and I'm, I'm going to let people put the, the dots together here, but um, it's, very, uh, it's very coincidental how all of these, uh, all of these events are happening in countries that uh, have upset Israel in the past. Now, as we've ta- as we've said, the elephant in the room is Israel. And one month ago, France set off on a stampede when its lower house voted to recognize Palestine, as we've just said. Now, mm. Palestine is in the International Criminal Court, poised to take down Israel for genocide. Suddenly, Islamic terror strikes France. Is Paris being punished for its pro-Palestine vote? In late 2003, Malaysia's Kuala Lumpur Tribunal found Israel guilty of genocide. A few months later, Malaysian planes start falling out of the sky. In (laughs) in 2011, Norway's Labour Party's uh, youth wing was poised to impose a complete blockade on Israel. Suddenly, the entire leadership of the party's youth wing was slaughtered in a professional operation falsely attributed to a lone nut Anders Breivik. Now, I'm going to let people put the dots together there, (laughs) but uh, it's quite... It's it's quite coincidental that all of these events are happening in countries that have, have opposed the elephant in the room, John. Yeah, it is the elephant in the room, and countries have opposed it, and look what's happened to them. Recall, and this is probably where old mate Tim O would have come in handy, recall that when Bob Carr was the foreign minister, which was only mm. for like a year or so, once that government finished, he wrote a book, like a 500-page tomb, on his time as the foreign minister of this country here, Australia. And he wrote, among many other things, that it was his opinion that what he called the Zionist lobby in Melbourne had more access to the prime minister and more say in this country's foreign policy, specifically towards Israel, than the foreign minister of the day. That was his opinion. He wrote that in his book. And, of course, he was lambasted by the media, decried as being some kind of uh, uber-wealthy you know, doesn't understand how tough it is for people at the bottom, complains about having to ride in business class rather than first class, did everything they could to character assassinate him. To get off the front page is the fact that here we have an ex-foreign minister who only just finished his stint as foreign minister saying, hey, there's a Zionist lobby in Melbourne that have more say on our policy to do with Israel than I did as the foreign minister. Do you Mm. recall that one? I do. And I recall that Bob Carr was also exposed leaking Labour Party secrets back to the United States for for 20 plus years ago for the last 20 plus years Bob Carr's been I put that as an article on my website so Bob Carr's not someone who's just on the outskirts of the politics he yep. knows what he's talking about and you better believe if he says it in his book it's more than likely true exactly right and that's why we always have to benefit the question who benefits so mm. I'll read out one more article and this one is from the Australian another Uncle Rupert uh, publication <laughs> titled Paris terror attacks Netanyahu invites French Jews to immigrate this is from January 11 today quote Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has invited Jews in France to immigrate to Israel in the wake of the terror attacks that have left 17 people dead in a statement Mr Netanyahu told French Jews that Israel is their home and his government wants them to move to his country To all the Jews of France, all the Jews of Europe, I would like to say that Israel is not just the place in whose direction you pray. The state of Israel is your home, he said in a statement, referring to the Jewish practice of facing Jerusalem during prayer. Four of the fatalities in France's three-day wave of violence were Jews killed in an attack on a kosher supermarket hours before the start of the Jewish Sabbath on Friday. French PM Manuel Valls, meanwhile, sought to reassure his country's half-million-strong Jewish community, saying during a visit to the Paris area where the supermarket siege took place that France without the Jews of France is not France. While Mr. Valls acknowledged worrying anti-Semitic trends, he said France was home to the largest Jewish community in Europe and the oldest, which has contributed so much to the Republic 
end quote. So already Netanyahu is saying to the to the Jews of France and to Europe, come to Israel. If you are afraid of rising anti-Semitism in uh, France, come to Israel. Of course, the more they expand in Israel, the more Palestinian land that they take. Mm. Even if you don't want to buy into the idea that Mossad was at the heart of this, as they are so often, even if you don't want to believe into that, Clearly, Netanyahu is using this as a way to get more immigration into Israel to help in their agenda of making Israel a Jewish country. I don't think anyone can deny that. Zach, are you going to try? No, I don't, <laughs> because I agree with you. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's what I wanted to bring to the table today, Ethan. What I didn't bring was an article from, I think it was the end of last year, the start of this year, saying again that one of the uh, France's leading politicians might have been there, Francois Hollande, saying that 2015 would be the year where he would stamp out racism and anti-Semitism. Mm. So they're making anti-Semitism specifically one of their goals of eradicating or reducing, and they're trying to play this as being an anti-Semitic attack, that these uh, people who were killed in the kosher supermarket were killed just before, uh, just because they're Jewish. And of course, just like all of these events, they were killed before the raid. We've seen no evidence of their death, and many people are going to rightfully question, is this another staged event? Ethan, what say you? And the and the people that supposedly did the killings always end up dead and don't get to yeah. speak for themselves. Yeah. Isn't that right? It's just ironic how that happens, isn't it, Zach? Well, what about the very clear and obvious religious attack on the Middle East from the Western world? Mm. What about that? They don't want to expose... No, it's all about... That's That doesn't exist. It's all about this, Zach. <laughs> Wasn't it James Cameron, the Prime Minister of the UK, that said that... Um, there's not an exerted effort by Western governments to attack the Muslim faith. Mm. No, he said he did say that. You're right. He also said that anyone who doesn't believe that, anyone who believes that the West is trying to attack uh, the Muslim faith, is on par with being a non-violent extremist. Anyone who believes that 9/11 was, to use his words, a Jewish plot, is a non-violent extremist. Anyone who thinks that the 7-7 London bombings official story is bunkum is a non-violent extremist. And then he said that those non-violent extremists are on par with the actual violent extremists. Mm -hmm. So you see we have a situation where just us here for sitting here are construed by the British PM David Cameron as being on par with uh, extremist terrorists. When we can sit here and say the ones that you're putting on TV aren't even shooting anybody. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and, mean? And then if I recall, he called for military action in the Middle East... Didn't he? Mm. Yeah, it was a terrifying speech, and we went over that uh, in episode one, I believe it was. Yeah. Episode one, we went over it right at the beginning because the first time I ever uh, we ever set up the studio here, Jono, we watched that speech on television before we started our our very first practice episode to say, look, this is who our enemy is, and this is why we're doing our show. It came at just a, the perfect time to light the fire inside of us as to we need to do something now because time's running out. And, Zach, you made a good point about how they're pushing anti-Semitism over there, but they're not talking about the, the persecution of the West against it. Let's look at what Rupert Murdoch said mm. following this event. He said, um, and for once I actually like the side sarcastic approach of the article by the ABC of all platforms to say this. <laughs> but they said, in case you were thinking, hey, I wonder what News Corporation boss Rupert Murdoch thinks about what's going in on going on in France. You finally have an answer. Turns out all Muslims are to blame in one way or another for their religion's, quote, growing jihadist cancer. After he received widespread criticism for, you know, holding a religion of billions of people responsible for the actions of extremists, he doubled down. In another, in another tweet, Murdoch said, quote, political correctness is preventing people from seeing the truth. And these are his two exact quotes right here. The first one was, maybe most Muslims peaceful, he, he spelt it as Muslims, <laughs> maybe most Muslims peaceful, but until they recognize and destroy their growing jihadist cancer, they must be held responsible. So this is what Ruben Murdoch's saying on his Twitter. He's saying that until these extremist wings are held accountable for and destroyed, all of the religions should be held accountable for their actions. Then when he had an outcry, he'd come back saying, there's a big jihadist danger looming everywhere from Philippines to Africa to US to Europe. Political correctness makes for denial and hypocrisy. And one, one reply to that was, when are you going to take responsibility for the Iraq war, which led the rise of ISIS in the first place, you vile creature? And I think that sums it up perfectly because Rupert Murdoch, we know it, he basically runs this country now with, in terms of getting political leaders in, in terms of the, the mass control of the media. If he wants to say that 
if he wants to push his notion that all um, all Muslims should be responsible, you better believe that's going to filter down through his editors, and that's what we're seeing. Mm. Well, what gets me with that kind of comment is that they are, as we've discussed before, running dual, sometimes triple narratives mm. that don't go well together. On the one hand, this country is being flooded with mass immigration. If you look at all Western white nations, we have the second highest per capita rate of immigration in the white Western developed world, second only to Spain, much of whose immigration comes from other parts of Europe. Whereas we here in Australia, much of immigration comes from places like China, like India, formerly places like uh, India and Pakistan as well. So we get massive rates of immigration, many of them Muslim. And on the one hand, we're told that to question that makes us racist, to be concerned about preserving what we have in this nation, at least for the time being, and then maybe slow down the immigration. We're told that's xenophobic and or racist. And they have to push that narrative to promote mass immigration because agendas are served by it, including Rupert Murdoch and his newspaper. I mean, they, they give no time at all to the reduce immigration parties. They they were one of the key players in taking down Pauline Hanson, who was okay. getting a lot of support in the late 1990s. They were literally, along with Tony Abbott, part of taking down Pauline Hanson. So on the one hand, they happily support mass immigration and they take down who, who opposes it. At the same time now, they're going to take part in this operation of making us all scared of the Muslims who are already here. And the point I always make is you have to question the mainstream media when on the one hand, they want you to hate Muslims who are in Muslim countries, have to go and bomb them, have to go and bomb them, have to go and split them up, all their leaders are dictators, etc. They want us to hate the Muslims in Muslim countries. But usually they want us to love the Muslims who are here and to want more Muslims, which is why I see this tweet from um, on Uncle Rupert as being a little bit different. He's actually taking a different path here. Mm. And he's even saying that we should be scared of the Muslims in this country and and not love the Muslims in this country. And he's getting the backlash that you expect, you know, to his comments from the from the masses who have been conditioned to love all Muslims. And so we've got a real melting pot going on right now, not just in terms of the cultures that are here, but the ideas that are being expressed. And I think if it weren't for the staged events and all the sites that are taking place, this year would still be a, an exciting year, a fascinating year. It's going to be a big year because look at all the narratives that are being pushed. Even some of the people pushing the narratives are coming to push different narratives. Mm. And that's, that's what I wanted to open a discussion for as we get into the last sort of 15 minutes of the show is all of this is just all over the place. And we... I want to open up a discussion about what is the the real agenda here? What are they doing? You know what I mean? We've, we've exposed that, yes, they're using this to push anti-terrorism legislation to expose their wars in the Middle East, but it seems like there's too many different hands involved and too many different directions are taking. And I just wanted to open up just to get some general thoughts about where we're going to continue on from this, Zach. Wow, I really don't know. I think it's always been about control. It's never necessarily been about money, even though they use money to control people. It's always been about controlling people by dividing them, using racism as a tool to divide people. Yeah, and I think in a couple of our first episodes that we did, Jono, we started to talk about um, where this could head if this Middle Eastern situation intensifies and there's an interesting article that the female accomplice of the gunman involved in the Paris killings is believed to have left France before the Friday attacks and has crossed the Turkish border into Syria. Ah, oh, you're kidding. Raud has reported, citing security sources. She's reportedly a partner of Kolobi, Cobb Bally, whatever his name was, the the, the darker one, fake person, yeah, yeah. With the, 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 the the supposed just darker make up one. a name from. He's made up in the first place. Just call I'm him. calling him AC, <laughs> who is believed to have shot a policewoman on Thursday before storming into the kosher market on Friday, where he shot four hostages. He was then supposedly killed in the assault, and the female accomplice, who was supposedly directing all of these orders and a major part of it by now has gone into Syria and now there's a push. We need to go get her from Syria because she's a major part and she could direct more attacks. And we've spoken in previous episodes about how vital Syria is in the major scheme, John. It's been obvious for a long time now, even to people who don't pay as much attention. You don't have to pay too much to this. It's been obvious that the plan is to go in and topple Assad in Syria. That couldn't be more clear. And I think actually one of the ways that ISIS was supported in the first place, one of the reasons they were supported was because of all the many uh, benefits that they give the people in charge. One of them is to fight Assad's forces 
on the border of Syria and Iraq to fight as much, take as much of Assad's resources to keep IS out as possible to leave him weakened. And the country of Syria over the last few years has been destroyed. You can look at photos from city after city, how it used to look before this incident, before all, the, all these events in Syria, and how it looks now. That's a country that's been destroyed by the, largely by the West. And of course, a couple of years ago, there was that fake Assad is using chemical weapons on his own people uh, line that was going to be used as a pretext to invade him the same way they did to Libya, the same way they did to Iraq. That was, that was the plan. It didn't work out because people exposed the fact that that was another PSYOP. But that didn't stop their plan. It just pushed their plans back. Their mm. plan is still to topple Assad. That is absolutely clear. And it, with all this rhetoric that's coming out, you know, now we've got terrorists that are fleeing to Syria. Yeah, I mean, right. how can they say... I mean, how can any smart person hear that? That Reuters is already reporting, <laughs> well, she fled, she made it into Syria. Where do they get that information? How do they know? And, well, right. and if the information's coming from intelligence community, how come the intel community is still tracking these people to the point where they know their movements, but they don't ever stop their attacks? I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. Clearly, Syria is in the crosshairs, and this mm. could be the year where they make that formal. Yeah, well, it's always it's always been on the agenda, and that's how when I speak of the real ISIS, there are real um, extremists that are over there that were given the weapons, were funded, and were let to were let loose basically, and they toppled Libya, and they were supposed to topple Syria, but Syria fought back while the media were portraying the people fighting as the people uprising against the evil dictator, when it was the people defending themselves against these evil. You know, these people that have been funded by the West in their new Toyotas and their AK-47s and rocket launchers in the middle of the desert, which I suppose they just grew. I mean, there's no way they could have got them to them any other way. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the notion is still going to be pushed that Syria is next because Syria can draw in Iran and Iran will draw in Russia. And that's when the next world war will begin. It's blatantly obvious. Yeah, I think there's a clear agenda in the Middle East and it's always been about oil because oil's always been about the petrodollar. And I think they're trying to control as much oil as they can so they can control the money for as long as possible so they can control us for as long as possible. I agree with that and I think it even goes one step further. And what I'll do is, as, as always, we provide all the information on our website, Oz Roundtable. On the episode 14 page, I'll provide a link to a report by a guy named Oded Yinon. Now, this is from a couple of decades ago, but basically he lays out his plan for Israel, the secure, like securing greater Israel. That is not just Israel today, but all of the lands that he believes, and many Israelis believe, and many Jewish people in general believe, belongs to their homeland. And he points out that what they have to do is to keep the Muslims fighting each other, which is exactly what the Iraq-Iran war was. On the one hand, you had America giving weapons to Saddam Hussein during the 80s. At the same time, Israel was supporting Iran. Get the Muslims fighting each other, destroying each other. Very clever tactic. Now what's the plan? To split Iraq up into three, into a Kurdish north and then into a Sunni side and a, and a Shia side. That's the plan. Break it down to three states. Three states is much weaker than one powerful Iraq. And to do the same thing to Turkey, get the Kurds in Turkey lobbying to be separated. Do this all over the place and have these pliant states. The people who are rising up against their own government, if they're funded by, say, Israel for argument's sake or by, you know, Israeli assets, then they're less likely to attack Israel in the first place. So they become like a pliant state. So not only are you carving up the countries that you plan to eventually take some land from, but you're also making sure that the resistance that rises up and replaces the government are on your side to begin with. It's a genius strategy, and it was laid out by a prominent Israeli writer decades ago, Mm. Oded Yinon, a plan for securing the greater Israel. Now, anyone can read that for themselves. They can look at that. They can Mm. look at what we've just discussed. They can look at the greater geopolitical games that are being played, and they can connect their own dots. It's not hard to see exactly what's happening. And I want to make a point going back to this Paris incident before we get back into the general discussion, and that is people will say to me, hold on, you've just laid out these four or five articles, a basic timeline, threats from Netanyahu, uh, the vote not getting ahead, France still voting for it, Palestine joining the ICC. Are you suggesting that Israel is somehow involved in these Paris attacks? Yeah, I am suggesting that. But before I suggest any more, let me point out that back in 1967, the USS Liberty was attacked by the Israeli Defense Force in a blatant false flag attack where they were trying to get the US to go to war with, I think it was Egypt, but it was really the Israelis who were shooting and trying to destroy and killing many American people. That's all in the public record now. We know that that's true. The idea of false flags isn't just the realm of conspiracy theory. It's the realm of historical fact. Now, if they're willing to kill in cold blood 
their allies America to draw Egypt into a war, what makes you think they wouldn't be willing to kill, or just pretend to kill, depending on what the case may be, a bunch of French people or Jewish French people to further their agenda there? Why wouldn't you think they would do that? Of course they might. So you come back to the question, who benefits? Mm. Do you think ISIS benefits? Let's just pretend that this was ISIS who did this. Does ISIS or Al- it's Al Qaeda? They're even they're going retro. They're telling us that this yeah. was Al Qaeda. <laughs> yeah, I saw and, two conflicting yeah. things. It said uh, ISIS in this country claims responsibility. Now Al Qaeda down here claims responsibility. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, is it Al Qaeda? Is ISIS? It doesn't matter how would they benefit. They wouldn't. It's ridiculous. Yeah, the people who do benefit. That's the military industrial complex. Yeah, that's the draconian uh, governments of different countries. And of course, it's anyone who wants to support more war between the Muslims or the Christians and the Muslims in the Middle East. And all roads lead to Tel Aviv, my friend. Mm. Absolutely. Now, that's probably where we should leave that conversation of the Paris event. I hope that our listeners have enjoyed it. We've up to 39 people watching live right now, which is a record. So I say thanks to everyone in the chat box for your comments. It's probably time now to move to our final thoughts. And we like to start off uh, with the guests. So, Zach, not just on this show, but on 2015 and just the whole topic of red pill, deprogramming, <laughs> yeah. all the rest of it. Give us a couple minutes of your thoughts. Yeah, well, I'd just like to bring up just one thing that was referencing the Middle East situation that you were talking about a moment ago, which was Dick Cheney, years before the Second Iraq War, knew full well what was going to happen. He knew it was going to be a quagmire. He knew it was going to carve up the country. It's in one of Storm Cloud Gathering's videos, his interview. It's right there. You can see it. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He did it anyway. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's been a plan. The New World Order has been planned for the last century, even further beyond, if you want to believe that like I do. For thousands of years, this order has been playing. And as you mentioned earlier on in the show, it doesn't happen overnight, boom, with a big event. It calculates, it calculates over time. And step by step, all of a sudden, now we've got militarized police. Now Mm. we've got all of this. Now we've got draconian laws. There's, you know, chips going into people's arms for iPhones to control their iPhones. Ten years ago, you were a conspiracy theorist if you talked about chips in the arm. Now they've calculated it slowly, slowly, and it's going to continue on until we wake up and realize the pyramid's around us and the guns are drawn and we've got no way out. That's Mm. why we need to wake people up now. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And uh, Zach, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's been a blast having you on and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. I love that. Thanks for having me. No worries. Now, we'll move on to you, Ethan. Any final thoughts to leave the listeners with? Uh, just another plug for tottnews.com. We've got heaps of content coming up. And please go and check out and share the video that I cut from last week's Australian Roundtable about the disproving the sniper narrative about um, the Sydney siege because now more than ever, you can spread that to anyone whether they believe the official story or not and it will resonate with them. So I appreciate you uh, if you would check that out. And... Just in regards to the Paris incident, um, just as the Sydney siege, more is going to come out. So for people out there, please download the videos you see online that are being censored. Please do all of this. Please get any information you can. You know, Send it through to AustralianRoundtable at gmail.com if you want us to speak about it. More and more information is going to come out. Um, and uh, it's, we're only going to go deeper down the rabbit hole from here. And just one quote that I found online is what I think. So far, a false flag, it walks like one, it talks like one, and it perpetrates the 9-11 false flag narrative about radical Islam like one. So I'm calling it a false flag until proven otherwise. And yep. that's that's my final thought that I'd like to leave everyone on there. I couldn't agree with it more. I'm happy to believe that Katrina Dawson and Tory Johnson died in that cafe. Just show me some evidence. I'm happy to believe that this whole event in Paris was a real event. Just show me some evidence. You show me evidence and I'll believe it. I'll happily admit I was wrong. I'll, you show me evidence. You show me the CCTV footage of the Sydney siege of Johnson and Dawson being in that building as the government's in there. And I will go on air and say I was wrong. Yep. You know what I mean? I spent three episodes being wrong. I'm not too proud to admit that I'm wrong. Just show me the evidence. They're not going to because the evidence doesn't exist. Now, my before I get to my final thoughts, uh, Laker Craig in the chat box asked, Will there be a We'll Do It Live this week? I've got no reason to think that there won't be. Jeff C's channel has come back. YouTube allowed his channel to come back after three or four weeks hiatus. So I can't see any reason why there wouldn't be a We'll Do It Live. So uh, my answer to you, like a Craig, is yeah, I'd imagine so. But, you know, stay tuned. And Adam Bravo, just in the chat box a few moments ago, said that there's no point hating people who have been subjected to psychological warfare. And I believe he's referring to the Israelis. And I have to make this point clear. 
I have no beef with Israeli citizens, Jewish, Palestinian, or otherwise. I've got no beef with them. Mm. And I have Jewish friends who have been to Israel. They have this program where they basically pay for you to go on a tour to, to Israel if you are uh, qualified for a dual passport. And the idea is that once you go on a tour there, you're going to love it so much you want to immigrate there because they want more and more Jewish immigrants. And so a friend of mine took up that option to go on one of these, I forget what they call these things, uh, homecoming or something. He took up that offer and went to Israel, apparently had a really good time. But while he was there, Operation Protective Edge was beginning or it was, it was at that time. And he said that several times during his stay, they were told there were rocket attacks. Everyone had to go and huddle at the basement of buildings. There are many Jewish people who are genuinely scared of the rocket attacks because their media is full of propaganda, just like ours is. Yep. So can you blame the Israeli people for believing that the Palestinians, that the Muslims, they're can you blame them? They're brainwashed, just like the people in this country are brainwashed, into believing that we've got an ISIS terror threat. So I have no beef with the Israeli people, just like I have no beef with the American people, even though I detest their government. Just like I have no beef with the Australian people, even though I detest our government so anyone who wants to suggest for a moment that i hate this group or that group or that i'm anti this or anti that that's complete nonsense i call it as i see it and that's what i'm always going to do until they shut us down which they'll probably try and when they do we'll just go somewhere else you know what i mean yeah. the truth is getting out there you can't stop the truth it's got too much power they know it that's why they're getting scared so thanks to adam bravo for the comment mate i agree with you 100 percent now, just on to my final thoughts as always max resistance on the tuesday night in american time we'll do it live wednesday night uh, so long as nothing else comes up in between then. I was on We'll Do It Live during the week. Had a great time. It's a terrific show. They're getting 380 live listeners. That was what they got to their last show. So they're getting big. This whole thing is getting big. And like we always say, Ethan, if we can do this, if those guys in America can do it, if they can do it in Canada, anyone can do it. We're getting hundreds and hundreds of viewers every week now, including up to 30, 40 live. People, there's an audience out there for this. So if you've ever thought of doing a show like this, now's the time to do it. As always, check out australianroundtable.com. That's ozroundtable.com for all of the links so you can verify all of what we said for yourself. It's most important that you do. And we'll be back here, of course, next week at about 4 p.m. with another big show, episode 15. And hopefully, Ethan, we'll get a chance to finally discuss the climate change hoax. And if we do, I'm sure it'll be a great show. Yeah. Thanks, so, everyone. Thanks to the listeners, and we'll see you next time.